Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the first hearing of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations in 2018 and uh, for the current term of the City Council. My name is Jimmy Van Bramer and I am thrilled to be the chair uh, once again for this committee. Uh, I have been the chair since the first day that I was in the City Council uh, and it is uh, a great honor and privilege to be the chair of Cultural Affairs and Libraries for all 12 years that I will be uh, blessed to serve in this body. Uh, I want to uh, welcome uh, to the committee um, Councilmember Joe Borelli, who is here uh, from Staten Island. Uh, this is his first hearing, and um, I, contrary to rumors, did not do it specifically for Councilmember Borelli. Um, and I want to also mention that we have several other hearings going on in the City Council at this moment, uh, including a very important Parks Committee meeting across the street. Other members are on their way. But uh, we want to get started because we have the commissioner uh, and we have uh, so many folks who want to testify on this important hearing. So we are now formally in session. Uh, the topic that we're going to be discussing today, art as resistance state in Trump's America. As everyone here surely knows, in our democratic society, freedom of expression is paramount uh, and often it is the arts that make manifest that vision, uh, lending form to our goals and ideals. Art exposes and helps resolve issues of social justice. Uh, as a cultural tool, art and culture humanize and actualize the emotions, grievances, and fears of the disenfranchised. Art can elicit a visceral reaction. Uh, it can shock and inspire action. Art has the power to change the lives of young people in particular. As a global cultural capital, New York City is home to a wealth of cultural amenities and a thriving creative sector. Recognizing it's important in our democratic society, the city has long been committed to the preservation and enhancement of our cultural sector. The Department of Cultural Affairs works to create and expand access to public programming, provide technical assistance, build audiences, and ensure that the arts and culture are central to the city's economic vitality and quality of life. The Department of Cultural Affairs in New York City surpasses even the National Endowment of the Arts as the largest arts funder in the country. However, it is important to note, particularly within the context of this hearing, that one of President Donald Trump's first actions in office was to propose the complete defunding and elimination of the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, uh, and so many other things that we hold dear. Now, it's important to note that there are differing opinions uh, about President Trump. Um, in fact, uh, Councilman Borelli is wearing his uh, Donald Trump button on his lapel right now. Um, and uh, uh, it's fair to say that we have uh, very different opinions on the president and on uh, much of what's happening in the country. Uh, but we will disagree today respectfully, uh, particularly with uh, amongst ourselves here in this room. But make no mistakes, uh, I have been very clear uh, in my very strong opposition to the president. But the Department of Cultural Affairs, of course, um, uh, doesn't necessarily take a position on uh, the president, but certainly has an incredibly important role in making sure that we beat back these attempts to destroy the arts and culture in this country. So, in addition to providing programmatic and capital support to local arts and cultural organizations, New York City also has a history of successfully integrating the arts into the operations of city agencies and the delivery of city services. Uh, this includes DCLA's work with individual artists through the Percent for Art Permanent Public Art Program and the Public Artists in Residence Program. The department also supports New York City artists directly and indirectly through various ongoing efforts as well as through local arts councils need to pause there and say that the City Council 
is very proud to fund uh, the arts and provide so much of the funding that goes through the Department of Cultural Affairs. Now, such works are a testament to the power of art to affect positive social change, writing, addressing, and vocalizing social injustice in the world. I'll continue to work with my colleagues in government to promote the arts and culture and support artistic endeavors that aim to inspire and propel the ideals of open society forward. Now today we want to hear about how art and culture have been employed in this era of political uncertainty. As a gay man, I'm certainly aware of our history and the role, for example, that Grand Fury played in the HIV AIDS epidemic in the early days, using art to inspire and also to put pressure on then President Reagan, uh, among others, to do what was necessary when they did not want to. We are doing the same today, and I'm interested in hearing from uh, all of you in the cultural community about the ways in which you are responding, uh, in which your organizations are responding, uh, not necessarily in a uh, political way, but in a way that channels uh, the outrage that so many people are feeling uh, and using art and culture to empower people to use their voice. The First Amendment is still in effect in this country. Um, so we also want to talk about how we integrate the arts into transformative programming and services. Uh, and we also want to learn about how the Department of Cultural Affairs uh, intends to continue utilizing the arts uh, to effectively empower New Yorkers uh, to live their truths in this moment and to fight back against any and all attempts uh, to silence their ability to speak out in this moment through art, through culture, through expression, and through the right to organize, speak out, and fight back. So I'm thrilled to be a part of uh, this movement. I was thrilled that we had a very powerful rally on the steps of City Hall uh, less than a year ago. Uh, one of the biggest rallies we ever had with uh, David Byrne and the commissioner was there and lots of folks uh, defending the arts, not only in the city of New York, but in this great country that we call home. Uh, so with that, I wanna um, recognize some of the staff who helped uh, put this uh, together and we'll hear from the commissioner, uh, hopefully engage in some uh, lively discussion with, with all of you uh, and, and continue the work of resistance and uh, that is important to me. So I wanna thank uh, my chief of staff who is actually not in the room at this moment but he is just back from paternity leave and uh, we're thrilled to have Matt Wallace uh, back and uh, baby Gabriel, um, this is his first public shout out. Um, is uh, doing well and a welcome member to our city council uh, family. Uh, Andres Vija, my deputy chief of staff, uh, and um, David Ginsburg, our new legislative director. I want to thank uh, from our committee here, uh, Aminta Kilowan and Chloe Rivera, Alia Ali, uh, and also thank uh, for uh, stepping in and pinch hitting uh, Malcolm Butehorn and Nuzat Chowdhury who are working with us as councils for this hearing today. Uh, so with that, we will swear in Commissioner Tom Finkelpearl from the Department of Cultural Affairs and begin our testimony. Commissioner, if you'd raise your right hand, please. <clears throat> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Okay, shall I begin? Okay. Uh, good morning, Chair Van Bramer and members of the committee. I'm here today to testify with regards to the <clears throat> importance of arts and culture to New York's social and civic fabric and to DCLA's commitment to supporting cultural organizations that engage all New Yorkers. I don't think I need to convince anyone in this room that art has the power to mobilize, to uplift, and to bring us together as communities. Art and culture have a very special role in New York City in particular, where creative expression is a birthright and an essential part of our DNA. So for New Yorkers, it's natural to turn to art and culture to work through the issues of the day. 
They're an important part of how we communicate and connect with one another and how we understand the world around us. And there are great powerful ways that arts can respond to specific concerns and needs. We can band together to support our immigrant neighbors. We can stand up for free speech. We can um, defend the essential programs and funding that improve the lives of New Yorkers. As a nonpartisan funder of arts and culture, DCLA uh, strives to support our constituents in a wide range of ways. Following the 2016 presidential election, many nonprofit cultural organizations expressed a need to offer support to their communities and advocate for themselves. But there was a great deal of nervousness as to what sort of actions are appropriate for nonprofit organizations to be involved in. We heard questions such as, what constitutes political activity? Or is it permissible for a nonprofit to be involved in electoral politics and more? In response, we organized a legal panel at the Ford Foundation last April for DCLA grantees. The program was called Nonprofits and the Pitfalls of Politics, Navigating Lobbying, Political Activity, and First Amendment Issues in 2017. It featured legal experts who discussed the boundaries of lobbying and political campaign activity and the complexities of free expression, political criticism, and censorship. One general takeaway from the event was that there's a great deal that cultural sector can do to advocate for our communities and cultural organizations within certain limits. I encourage groups to carefully consider what these limits are for the specific interventions and activities in consultation with legal experts. For the many organizations that don't have in-house counsel, in-house legal support, a number of groups offer relevant services, including Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, Lawyers Alliance, and New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. For our part, DCLA offers a wide range of programs, initiatives, and support for all New Yorkers, including some of our more vulnerable neighbors. Let me focus for a moment on immigration. As you know, we continue to partner with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to include cultural, um, cultural benefits as part of the IDNYC program, an initiative that reaches out to all New Yorkers regardless of their immigration status, homeless status, gender identity, or other factors. Over one million IDNYC called, uh, with over one million IDNYC cardholders, the card is a hit in large part thanks to our cultural benefit partners. These groups span disciplines and boroughs. Some of them are probably in the room today. I know you are. Um, you all have provided more than a half million free memberships to IDNYC cardholders since 2015. Just as important, 77% of immigrant cardholders surveyed said they feel a stronger sense of belonging to New York City since they received their ID. We made this happen together, and it demonstrates the inclusive values New Yorkers embrace. Another collaboration we have with the Office of Immigrant Affairs to support New York's immigrant communities is called Cycle News. As part of DCLA's Public Artist in Residence program, Cycle News has, was initiated by artist Tanya Bergera and a group, of, a group called Mujeres in Movimiento in an effort to build trust with immigrant residents in Corona, Queens and increase awareness of government services available to them the mujeres have been circulating through the community on bikes, complete with uniforms and information materials they help design. They also bring their community voices and understanding back to city government. It's a simple but profound way to use art to signal our immigrant neighbors to our immigrant neighbors that the city wants to establish connections based on mutual understanding and respect. When it comes to federal funding for the arts, we unequivocally believe that public support for culture is a good thing. Just last month, the National Endowment for the Arts announced nearly $6 million in funding for over 200 cultural organizations in New York City alone. DCLA funds many of the same groups, giving them the, um, some of the resources they need to engage audiences and uplift communities in every corner of the city. I was proud to join Chair Van Bramer and other local leaders to call for re restoration of funding for the NEA, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Institute for Museum and Library Services last year. As part of these efforts, I also published an op-ed in Art News highlighting the importance of these funding streams, and we continue to highlight the need, for, uh, the need to hashtag save the NEA on social media. Yes, the funding remained in the federal budget last year. Sadly, these vital institutions were again targeted for elimination in the current presidential administration's proposed budget. Again, we will fight for their restoration. We have seen it demonstrated over and over that people living across New York and throughout the nation overwhelmingly value art and culture. A recent survey by the American Alliance for the Museums found that 97% of Americans believe that museums are educational assets for their communities. For a survey we commissioned as part of Create NYC, the cultural plan, 
we found that 97% of New Yorkers believe that art and culture are important to overall quality of life in New York City. That's within the margin er of error of 100%. So when we argue for the importance of investing in culture at all levels of government, we are confident we are delivering a message on behalf of all residents. Culture is an important <coughs> for our growth as individuals, for the health of our communities, and for a vibrant economy. We are inspired by the near unanimous support for culture from New Yorkers, as well as the members of this committee, and we look forward to continuing our important work together. Finally, we are committed to upholding the fundamental right to free expression, which has been challenged on several occasions in recent months. One notable example was the call by some to revoke public funding for the public theater based on their production of Julius Caesar uh, during last summer's Shakespeare in the Park. The title character bared a, a resemblance to the current president. I'll repeat what I said then. Threatening funding for a group based on artistic decision amounts to censorship. We don't impe uh, interfere with the content created by nonprofits that receive public support, period. Thank you for providing the opportunity to highlight these issues. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And <coughs> I want to recognize we've been joined by Councilmember Francisco Moya of said Corona Queens uh, and welcome him to the committee as well. So I wanted to uh, uh, talk about a few of the points that, that you raised. Uh, if President Trump were successful in eliminating funding for the NEA, NEH, and IMLS, how badly would this hurt the city of New York? And I'm not just talking about dollars. I'm talking about the assault on who we are. Um, and by the way, I think we have to add public broadcasting to that That's list. Right. That's a very large uh, funding. I didn't in my testimony, but uh, I think, <clears throat> so we estimated last year that the total I actually don't have the numbers with me, but you know, tens of millions of dollars of support will be lost. The other thing, and I think everybody in the room uh, would agree, often those are the first funders in uh, to projects. So you start a project, you get a grant. It may not be a huge grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, but it puts a kind of stamp on that program as something that's worthwhile, that has federal support, and it makes it so much easier to raise lots of other money for those programs. It happened to me again and again in my career when I was on the other side of the table, the leverage of those funds, I mean, that is the moment you get that stamp when that pro that's a go, that project is definitely gonna happen, and you can go out and say, we've got NEA or NEH or IMLS support. Um, it's fundamentally important, and it's leveraging far beyond the tens of millions of dollars, but I don't wanna <laughs> underestimate how important that money is also. So, talk though about the effect on artists and on cultural organizations and on those in the creative class. When we talk about what happened at the public theater with funding being threatened when <coughs> artistic decisions are made to represent the president in a way that he or his supporters don't uh, believe is flattering, um, what kind of chilling effect takes place amongst all of those who, who may be considering a production or a work that touches on the president or the current political climate. Uh, I'm interested in that because you obviously will hear from a lot of the folks behind you, but you also represent them. Yeah, I also just would like to mention, first of all, that Julius Caesar is not a play that says overthrowing a tyrant is a great thing. I mean, lots of bad stuff happens, as the mayor has said, to all the people who were overthrown. So it's, it's a very complicated play. I'd also like to point out that Barack Obama lookalikes were cast as Julius Caesar numerous times or several times during his administration. Um, but you know, it, in that particular case, there were uh, corporate sponsorships, I believe, that were withdrawn uh, from the public. I think I believe the public theater is here, and maybe they could comment more on that. Um, but it was a controversy that that you know those kinds of um, turmoil creates uh, an atmosphere of fear. Uh, in cultural organizations to touch on issues uh, that are important to touch on. And what we're saying is we believe that art artistic decisions need to be made independent of, of that kind of external pressure to be healthy decisions. So you mentioned immigration, which I know is important uh, to Councilmember Moya, um, especially, in, and you talked about uh, his district. But I would argue, again, this is my personal opinion, that immigrants in this country people of color uh, have been under assault and under attack by this administration in a million different ways. Um, 
how do you think that is impacting cultural organizations uh, run by um, uh, people of color, serving people of color, um, uh, immigrant audiences? Obviously, I'm very proud that we in the council created the Cultural Immigrant Initiative, uh, the only funding stream that is specifically targeted towards uh, organizations, cultural organizations, small cultural organizations that serve and, and produce work by and for um, immigrant audiences. Um, but obviously, those communities that specifically are under assault, and you could argue that many <coughs> communities are under assault right now, but none more so than immigrants and people of color, talk about that effect on, on, on organizations, cultural well, organizations. I mean, so my experience has been, look, there are, I'm not, I, I'm not here to comment on immigration policy or anything like that, but that the um, so resiliency and vibrancy of the cultural organizations and immigrant communities becomes even more important uh, in situations where those are places where people can come together in a safe space. You know, I visited like dance groups within immigrant communities, those grassroots organizations, many of which, by the way, are funded indirectly by cultural affairs through the arts councils, not necessarily all getting direct funding from us. Um, but I think it actually, arts and culture becomes even more important uh, in those contexts, and I find a lot of resiliency and vibrancy in those organizations. So are we uh, seeing this level of activity rise? I mean, are we seeing, are we seeing people in the cultural community uh, shrinking back and cowering, or are we seeing uh, what I would hope is the reverse, which is people actually becoming more activated, fighting back, uh, and not being afraid to produce the work that they want. So I, look, I don't have statistics to back it up, but my anecdotal belief is that, that it isn't, New Yorkers are not backtracking, that the embrace of uh, diversity in cultural organizations is very high, that, that I've seen that in relationship to diversity of staffs, um, boards, et cetera. The, um, the zoo, uh, the Bronx Zoo, just announced their first Latina, Latinx uh, chairman of the board yesterday. Uh, I think there's good things happening um, in all kinds of cultural uh, organizations throughout the city, and I don't think there's any backing down uh, on the basis of policy, federal policy. In fact, I, I do see the opposite. And do you think that <clears throat> any president who proposes to eliminate the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, IMLS, Corporation for Public Red, <coughs> Corporation for Public Broadcasting, cares about the arts, understands the arts. Uh, so I'm not. I don't make comments about per, per, you know any sort of direct political candidacy or anything like that. I support, and I'm very very strongly support the idea that federal funding for arts and culture is is absolutely a vital aspect of New York City's cultural life. And we're going to fight for that. We are fighting on the basis of the issue, not on the basis of the candidate or the political. It's a political position, the issue. So I take issue with that issue. You know I stood next to you, and we supported the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, I will do that again. Um, this is not about political candidates. I just, uh, that's, as a commissioner, I'm here to represent the issue, not the person. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> And as a council member, I can say that anyone who proposes to assault and destroy the arts is indeed proposing to destroy the soul of the United States of America. Um, I want to recognize we've been joined by Councilwoman Karen Kozlowitz from Queens, uh, who's also joined our committee in this term of office. And because he came back into the room, I don't know if you heard, I um, uh, was thanking all of the staff and my chief of staff, Matt Wallace, uh, who's just returned from paternity leave, is back in the room, so I want to shout out his baby son, Gabriel, um, who's five weeks old, and um, his first public shout out, Matt, uh, first of uh, uh, many, we hope. Uh, Council Member Borelli. Thank you very much. Uh, just a qu quick question, Commissioner. What is the policy if uh, groups funded by uh, DCA or city council through uh, DCA, if they are um, essentially part of the assault on free speech and, and are discriminatory? Um, I'm, you know, we believe in freedom of expression. I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but 
We don't get involved in artistic decisions one way or the other at cultural organizations. Um, and as long as people are adhering to the laws, et cetera, that we, are, we stay clear of artistic decisions. So in other words, if, if you were determinative or there was um, a, a public discussion over uh, one particular organization that received funding that was excluding people of a certain class, would that raise any red flags in your agency? I think I'd, you know, I'd like to, uh, it, this would have to be handled on a case-by-case on -case basis. If something was brought to us that uh, was on illegal, of course, uh, that would be of concern. I'd, I'd talk to my lawyers and find out what uh, action to take. So, uh, uh, in 2016, um, the, the Noble Maritime Collection, which is at Snug Harbor, not, not the same board, it's, uh, I don't want to get the groups confused, yep. um, they, they elected to uh, invite and then uninvite an artist uh, for a fundraiser they were having. Now, the artist's work sell for $1,000, $2,000, $3,000. It, by all accounts, it would have been a, uh, a, a large windfall for a group that receives pittances in compared to you know, what we fund them. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't allow this artist because of his political affiliations. I, is that, just in, in your view, is that sort of an assault on free speech? You know, I'd have to know the details. I don't know the, if there are contractual arrangements or not. Again, if something um, was an assault on free speech, if some law were broken, um, again, I would talk to my lawyers and find out what action to take. I don't know all the details. Of course, I know Noble quite well. I've been there many times. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Councilmember Ferrelli. Um, and Tom, maybe you can talk uh, also a little bit about um, some of the work that we're doing together. Um, because when we when we fund the arts in the city of New York, we send a very clear message about our values, right? Budgets are about values and, and, and we value the arts, but also we'd like to think that we're the leader in this city uh, in terms of culture and the arts for the country. Obviously, we provide more funding for the arts than any other city in the United States of America. Um, and, and again, not a political question, but how do we, as a city, through our funding and advocacy, put pressure on the federal government and the Trump administration to fund the arts, uh, to not seek to destroy the arts, as I would argue, I would argue they have been doing. Um, I mean, so again, some of the things we've been doing, we, we express ourselves publicly in support of the uh, public funding. Obviously, we've done this together. But I think actually just sort of leading by example, the idea that this uh, administration in collaboration with the council has had vibrant cultural um, budgets that, by the way, transcend administrations. There's been a gradual increase in funding from Giuliani to Bloomberg to, um, to de Blasio. So you might say so a conservative, a moderate, and a progressive. In New York City, the values of arts and culture have not changed. The council has been steadfast in their support, um, as has each of these mayors. So I think that, that that's an important thing to say uh, in relationship to the federal government. I mean, there was some <clears throat> there's been some back and forth about federal about our budgets, our city budgets, et cetera, with each of these administrations. But there's never been a thought by any of these uh, mayors or city councils to eliminate the cultural agency. I mean, I just, the idea of even proposing to eliminate, um, <clears throat> I know it's my job also that uh, I would be looking at, but the idea, could you imagine if New York City proposed to eliminate the Department of Cultural Affairs? What would that say to the country? And what does it say to the country when we say steadfastly that we believe in arts and culture, we have a partnership with our political establishment across, um, across the aisle? Um, to support arts and culture. So I think part of it is just, we're the next biggest after the federal government. The federal government overall is the biggest arts and culture public, uh, if you include the Smithsonian and everything else. But after that, there's no state, there's no city that comes close to us. So I think we have to lead by example and just say we believe in it. 
um, and that it's a core value of New York City to support arts and culture. And how do we, particularly in this age of Trump, make sure that the undocumented uh, among us are, are serviced by the arts, are a part of the arts, are welcome uh, when it comes to culture in the arts? What are you and we doing as a city uh, to make sure that our values include supporting all immigrants uh, in, in our city? Well, I mean, I think there's the two arts, things which obviously. really have all, already been mentioned. One is, of course, you know, the Cultural Immigrant Initiative, which has been the, uh, a great addition by the council, funded uh, all throughout the city. And the other is the IDNYC. And the IDNYC is a card that anybody can get as long as you prove, can prove that you live in New York City. Um, and I think that that's been opening the doors for hundreds of thousands of people. The card itself has been, as I said, well uh, accepted by immigrant communities across New York City. So I think, again, that, that partnership, and when, when I've gone around to other cities and talked about that, everybody has said that's an amazing success. No other card like this has been as successful in any other American city. And I think it's because of the folks back behind me, the arts and cultural community rallying around it and making it a thing that you know you really should have if you love arts and culture, age, gender, whatever, immigration status aside, everybody wants to get it. A million people have it. Uh, so my, my final question, unless any of my colleagues have questions for the commissioner, and then we're going to hear uh, from <coughs> some of these terrific organizations, which I think will produce a lively uh, discussion as well uh, amongst us all. But young people are, of course, impacted by this moment as well. And uh, we always want to reach young people uh, through the arts, you know, through arts <coughs> education and through exposure to uh, the visual and performing arts all the time. But uh, this can be a scary time for a lot of people in this country, young people uh, included, and uh, particularly if you think your family is being targeted by the President of the United States. Um, how do you see this Trump moment impacting young people as it relates to the arts? I mean, have you sensed uh, fear amongst young people uh, and, and are cultural organizations reaching those young people and letting them know that they're safe and they're going to be okay and part of the way that's going to happen is through uh, expressing themselves through art and, and becoming empowered through this movement? I mean, so I've seen, I've witnessed uh, the inclusion, you know, across lots of different barriers in arts education programs at cultural organizations. I think it's also very important to say that arts education in the public school system has been well supported by the council and the mayor in, those, in the last four years. I think there are 340 more licensed arts teachers. I'm under oath, so I'd like to say I think that's the number. Uh, it's over 300 more than there were four years ago. So investing in those full-time uh, licensed art education teachers in the, in the public school system has been important uh, in integrating arts and culture. Um, when we talk about our cultural institutions, we fund <coughs> you know, almost 1,000 organizations. 60% of those um, have arts education programs. Um, the CIG alone has millions of visitors. Uh, I was just up at the um, the zoo, they have hundreds of thousands of New York City, I think 300,000 public school kids go to the zoo each year. That's inclusive. It, it opens the door to these cultural institutions at a young age, and I think that's extremely important to continue all of that. Uh, thank you very much. Obviously, all that speaks to the importance of baselining our cultural funding as well because what would be a hearing with you and me if I didn't talk about baselining funding for our <laughs> cultural organizations um, uh, as another message to the president that we value the arts in the city of New York. Um, so unless my colleagues have any more questions for the commissioner, um, I'm anxious to hear from some of our uh, arts groups and, and, and hear what they're doing in response to the Trump moment. Okay, and I just want to say that I've, I serve on 38 boards 
uh, as part of my job, and I actually now have to run off to a board meeting. So I'd love to stay here, but I actually have to go. Thank you, Commissioner. So thank you so much. Thank you. So now we would like to hear uh, Katie Rubin from the Theater of the Oppressed, NYC. And Katie, are you testifying with someone else? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I just see that note on your uh, program. Ah, great. Amare Sander, Did we get that close? All right, and then is it Debbie Officer from African Voices Magazine? Would you like to join us on this panel? And uh, Matthew, Chavez. Matthew Chavez. What's that? Yes, we're doing panels of four. So there are two together and then uh, another individual who is not with the uh, Theater of the Oppressed. So it's uh, two together and two solo, but all one community, right? Um, yes, you can sit there a minute. Yeah, I think so. We're going to go to a three minute clock for all of the members of each panel uh, going forward. Katie, why don't you two start us off? There we go, yeah? Thank you all for having us. Uh, my name is Katie Rubin from Theater of the Oppressed NYC, um, and I'm here with Amare. Um, so, um, Amare's gonna talk a little bit more about a specific project um, that we did last year that was really uh, focusing on toxic masculinity and challenging some of the things we're seeing uh, from uh, the president right now um, among young people, but I'll just say, I wanna say a couple things about what Theater of the Oppressed NYC is doing in this time. Um, so we work uh, with communities facing discrimination uh, to inspire transformative action through theater, and that has led us particularly in the last few years to do legislative theater, um, which Councilmember Van Bramer has been a part of and championed. Um, and something that we're working on right now is to, uh, to grow legislative theater and creative advocacy as a tool for civic engagement, which we see as a really key need in the era of Trump, um, both because many communities are not uh, able to or vote or um, voting feels uh, not uh, useful at this moment. Um, and so our work is to bring together communities who are directly impacted by housing injustice, by homophobia, by um, poverty, by racism with legislators and policymakers to share the stories and actually creatively come up with policy together to share how policy is made and uh, really expose the way that we need our council members and our other city legislators and our government to be accountable to the people. Um, so one thing that we did last year is publish a report on legislative theater, um, which we're now sharing around to uh, convince folks about the power of art to impact policy and to engage people in democracy. Um, and I also, and we've registered to uh, the commissioner's point, we've registered as lobbyists, a lobbyist nonprofit organization uh, this year, so that we could really focus on creative advocacy and we've become a little passionate about the fact that arts organizations can do that and should be able to, should know how to do that. And we thank the Lawyers Alliance for sharing that with us. Um, and then uh, another point I wanna make um, about our current work to uh, hold government accountable and uh, be sustainable in this time when arts organizations are not um, sure of their future. Um, last year, um, I'm not sure if, if you all know, but last year we purchased a space in Midtown. Um, uh, we spent three and a half years holding the city and a developer, SJP, accountable to a deal they made uh, to have a 3,000 square foot space in Times Square um, be available for uh, the theater, a theater organization. Um, we purchased it in September for $20,000 um, and we are now landlords, uh, sustainable. Um, we have our space to rent out and <laughs> it's a, a big moment uh, for us and we've also made that space a sanctuary space so that all of our team knows how to protect our immigrant actors, what we do and do not need to say if people come to our space. Um, 
And we really feel like uh, in the time of Trump and feeling like developers and business people have all the power, it was really a coup for us to be able to hold, took a long time to hold the developer accountable to it. It was an air rights deal that they made um, with the city. And, uh, and also holding city government accountable and showing our whole community that city government does need to be accountable to deals they make that are supposed to benefit uh, the people. And now our community feels like we have a space, a home, there's all kinds of activity happening there all the time. Uh, do I have 30 more seconds? Okay, great. Uh, one more thing, there's so many things to say on this topic, um, but one more thing I wanna say is, uh, in terms of funding, um, we are also recipients of the Cultural Immigrant Initiative. We work with immigrants in Queens and Astoria, we work with immigrants in Sunset Park. Um, and uh, I know that this is probably, there's nothing to do about this, but something that one of my staff said to me in preparation for today is that uh, one thing that would help us, particularly when NEA funding, which we also receive, is, you know, unsure, but also some of our foundation funders are stretched thin because of everything that's going on, right? It's a tough time for funding. We're still waiting for our cultural immigrant funding for this year, and generally, the way, how do we know that we're going to have the city funding that we've been promised to do our work that we're already doing. I know that's a big issue, but it's something we talk about and we don't really know where to go with that. Yeah. Uh, another reason that I love you, at the end of this testimony, uh, a pitch to uh, speed up the funding that you've already been allocated. Uh, I love that. Um, so <laughs> thank you, Katie. Another reason why I'm a big supporter of Theater of the Oppressed. Thank you. Uh, NYC. Uh, we've been joined by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, the final member of the Committee uh, on Cultural Affairs here. Um, do you want to have uh, Amari yeah. speak next? Yeah, Amari? Yes. Hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Amari Sandals. I'm an actor from TONYC. And I would just like to talk to you briefly about um, what we do and the experiences in there. Um, TONYC is a very magnificent organization born and raised here in New York City um, that targeted school or school students such as myself and people of all ages and ethnic backgrounds. Um, in my experience with TONYC, a uh, specific troop that I've done last year targeted masculinity, as you've heard earlier. Um, the basic target of masculinity that we tried to portray to everyone, which we showed to not only adults but also students and elderly and everyone, and anyone who would want to come see was the image that you are supposed to portray since you are from a young age. Um, the idea of your image is everything. Um, that you are supposed to be this way and that if you're not this way, it's wrong. Um, what we also did was have our audience become actors as well. So we didn't ask the audience but so many questions and delete them in a state of confusion and try to see if they are understanding of what is going on and if they can see it inside the society that they live in. Because of this, it's much easier for them to come on stage and see if they could counteract what societal norms is doing. TLNYC does this not only now, but has been doing this, and I believe that it's very important, especially during now with Trump's reign. We all know and we all read Twitter how Trump reacts to uh, people who are not for him. I don't need to tell you how Twitter is. Um, I also would like to say that as an actor at TNYC and um, not really being too no knowledgeable of how everything works, it's refreshing and eye-opening to see how being able to do this without causing any uproar or violence and having a good time feels. And that plugging in more funding in this part, that um, companies like this should be mass produced and mass um, spread, not only in schools, but anywhere else. If Because anyone can become an actor, and I'm very grateful for that. And I did this in le with 50 seconds left. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is that the first time you've ever testified before city council? Yes, this is my first time in city hall too. Wow, congratulations, <laughs> and, and you didn't read, right? That was all off my brain. Wow. I'm but we're gonna, send, we're gonna send you something, we're gonna send you something. No, I mean, <laughs> feel free to send us something, but that was one of the most impressive performances I've seen. Um, Lottery will get you nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, uh, that was terrific. Um, uh, I've seen Theater of the Oppressed 
perform uh, many times, been part of uh, the legislative uh, events. Um, they're terrific. It's a terrific organization. Uh, but thank you for your testimony today. Debbie, would you like to be, speak next? Tough act to follow, but you can do it. <laughs> Hi. Um, my name is Debbie Officer, and I'm the book reviews editor at African Voices Magazine. And I wrote something <laughs> to present. I thought, well, you know, I would just read it from, you know, don't have your talent. So I begin with a quote from Timothy Snyder, author of Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. As they knew, Aristotle warned that inequality brought instability, while Plato believed that demagogues exploited free speech to install themselves as tyrants. For more than 20 years, African Voices magazine has been the sounding board for those who wouldn't be published or have their photos, films, or paintings viewed by a mainstream audience. It has always been our fundamental mission to give a platform to those who would otherwise be silenced, and even more so now. At this period when there is so much uncertainty in our society about funding for the arts, libraries, and education, we serve as a beacon for artists in the African diaspora and beyond. At a time when the current resident in the White House seems hell-bent on dividing this beautiful country that I grew to love as an immigrant girl, I know for sure that it will be the dancers, musicians, writers, filmmakers, photographers, painters, sculptors, and poets who will make sure we continue to rise. I now reflect on an evening in a small Tuscan town several years ago when I attended a fair with my oldest daughter. Someone handed her a poster of Guernica. This was painted 81 years ago by Pablo Picasso as a tribute to the freedom fighters during the Spanish Civil War. It still stands as a symbol to me, per, uh, sorry, it still, it still stands as a symbol to so many around the world who will never bow to tyrannical regimes. As inspiring as that moment was for me personally, I think so many years later, it's, it is imperative that arts organizations and individual artists continue to educate, advocate, and use their work as a medium to motivate and inspire the public. As an immigrant, a writer, an educator, a visual artist, and a mother, I speak on behalf of African Voices Magazine today as an organization and as a voice in the resistance against censorship, defunding of the arts, and tyrannical and, tyrannical and racially divisive government. In closing, I would like to dedicate this testimony to Elizabeth Catlett and Shirley Chisholm, two courageous women whose example should continue to inspire us all in the ongoing fight for equity and justice. And in the words of the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda, solemn is the triumph of the people with the passage of their great victory. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was terrific. Thank you. Um, and I definitely will use your line about the poets and the dancers and, yes, and the writers. Uh, yes, and I actually, my daughter who's sitting behind me, my youngest, she was happy that I put dancers in. She's a ballerina, so she wanted me to plug one for the dancers. How wonderful. Yes. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Uh, Matthew? Hi. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a piece of work that I did. As an, I'm an individual. I'm not part of any organization. I don't have any affiliation, really, of any kind. I'm just like a dude in the world. Um, so when I moved to New York in, in late 2015, one of my major goals was to help people to feel better about all the stuff that they feel bad about. And I soon realized that people feel good just by having a patient listener to talk to them. And so I started setting up a table with two chairs, and I had a sign that said Secret Keeper, and I kind of became New York's Secret Keeper for a time. And I listened to anyone that wanted to stop by, and this is in various subway stations all over New York. And uh, people would say things like, oh, this is great, this is like therapy. And while I'm not a professional of any kind in that realm, uh, uh, people enjoyed listening to the subway therapist, and so I leaned into it and bought a brown suit and a tie, and, and I started setting up a pseudo-fake office in uh, subway platforms, and especially in the, the, the transfer tunnel between the 6th and 7th Street avenues uh, at 14th Street. And so uh, I did this for months uh, in four-hour blocks, 
Uh, I tried to go out every week, but you know, like many artists in New York, I was dog walking and bartending and hustling and trying to just make it. And uh, <clears throat> the length of our conversations actually made it very difficult to talk to more than 10 people in a week or so. Uh, so in the morning after the 2016 presidential election, I wanted to reach a broader audience, and so on my way to my office in the subway, I brought uh, packets of sticky notes, and I wrote on the wall behind me, express yourself. I don't know if people in the room or if the council's familiar with this work, but um, at any given time from November 10th through uh, December 16th, there were tens of thousands of sticky notes on the walls of the subway uh, where people expressed themselves in a variety of different ways. Um, and you know, the response was pretty immediate and electric and uh, thousands of notes were written on the first day and then it continued on over time. Uh, I, I, you know, just in New York alone, tens of thousands of people uh, jumped at the opportunity to express themselves and then I saw that project spread throughout the nation and in various places and you can still see it today. There's organizations in New York that have big sticky note walls and things like that. So. Uh, the goal of the project wasn't actually to amplify any messages of resistance, but it was um, to just benefit the people in my community. <clears throat> I wanted to be a conduit for the expression <clears throat> of the people around me. <clears throat> of course, my voice is failing right now. Um, and what was great is that I helped to transform people's fears and uncertainties into something that was more positive, and it provided an opportunity for conversation and a venue to have discourse about the injustices that we face and how we can combat them. Um, I, in short, you know, I would like to see uh, more structures and uh, support for individuals without any kind of organizational focus that can create the opportunity for individuals who maybe aren't as daring as me to go out and do public work that's for the public. Thank you. Um, on your last point, uh, absolutely, we, we feel very strongly about supporting individual artists and, and creating more funding streams for individual artists. Um, but secondly, I want to thank you because obviously uh, I too was well aware of the Sticky Note um, Resistance Project, went to see it, um, uh, but I never knew the dude who started it. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, in some ways, I like that. <laughs> super cool that we got to meet you today. And, uh, and uh, well, is it still on 14th Street or is it still up? Um, so I st continue to go out and set up my office and occasionally, like after um, Charlottesville, the, the event that happened there, I did a project where I invited people to write letters. Uh, on larger sticky notes with lines. And so I, I, do, I still do sticky note projects, but it's no longer at 14th Street Union Square, and it would never have been allowed to. To be honest, I don't think I would have been able to do it there in the first place if that was the first location. Uh, because I was doing it somewhere else where there weren't regular you know, people walking by, um, that were part of the MTA, they didn't really yeah. stop it from happening and before it started. And obviously, you know that it's spread all over the, the country, but you probably don't know all the stories. <clears throat> in a subway stop in my district in Long Island City, Queens, uh, our Girl Scout troop um, set up their own uh, display, and, and then uh, the MTA took it down the right. next day, which created a huge problem for the MTA. Right. And because um, <laughs> no one messes with the Girl Scouts. Yeah. And, <laughs> Uh, and they were forced to put it back up again, mm -hmm. and then it grew, and uh, uh, the Girl Scouts uh, took your, your project and, and made, great. It, made it larger. Um, so uh, before I open it up to any of our colleagues, I just wanted to ask uh, everyone on the panel how the presidency of Donald Trump has impacted your work, yourselves, and what are you hearing uh, from your communities about the Trump administration and all of that negativity that you talked about on Twitter, uh, all of what I would argue is a lot of hatred and divisiveness um, aimed uh, squarely at, at communities like the ones that I represent, right, incredibly diverse communities. Uh, what are you feeling, how are you feeling, how is your work uh, impacted by Trump, and, and what are you doing to resist? 
So I, I think that when we look at just a, look at it as a Trump issue, I think it's what we should look at is how what fear does, you know. And so I think for us as a magazine at African Voices, our concern, of course, is funding, and of course, reaching as many people as we can, which we are doing now through the internet and so forth. And I think there is a real fear that the arts really are under attack, and they are. I mean. You know, the first thing to, um, I mean, that everyone uh, became aware of was the NEA cuts, the threat to cut, you know, the fund. And I think that it's, it's real for people. I think um, for young kids, it's scary. I mean, because they're made aware that library, you know, funding may be cut and things like that. I remember when RIF was around, I don't know if you remember that program, mm -hmm. and kids look forward to, like, going to the library every, what, three or six weeks or something, and they would get a free book and you know that was cut under bush and then now other things are being cut i think there are there is real fear in communities and i mean it is in the arts because a lot of after school programs are affected um, you know we're here in the city where everything's about taking a test and you know doing well in just the academics and so for families it's a concern because you know arts and ed is something that we took a part of in um, African Voices, and now that's you know one of our concerns is to keep that program going. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. As a young person um, here, I would like to say that it is kind of on the scary side, and as an actor, it's also on the useful side because we look at Trump and we look at everything he does, any type of I want to say opposition to him, and how he takes it. And then it affects the art community because we can say oppositions anytime that we feel like it. First Amendment. Um, as me personally, effect, as affected by Trump and what he stands for, um, on a personal note, I don't agree with a lot of things he says, or basically anything he says, but I still look at it as a lesson. A lesson to which what we have done as a country, as a unit together, what we have done, and then if this is what we've done, what can we do to remedy it or make it better? Because if we sit around and do nothing, um, nothing is going to change. Um, a great example of that is the new movement that is happening because of gun control laws. Um, and it just makes me very happy for my generation. We are doing some stuff. Have you ever thought of running for office? <laughs> See, you are not the first person to like say that to me. And I will tell the same person, if I'm offered running for office, I say, hey, why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just say, it's rarely offered uh, to you. <laughs> Generally, you gotta fight. Uh, to sit at this table, but um, uh, <laughs> we can hope in your case you'll just be offered this, the opportunity to sit here. Um, but uh, we have every faith and confidence that uh, should you want to do anything, you'll be able to achieve it based on what I've seen here today. Uh, Matthew, did you have something you wanted to add? Sure. Um, since I was doing the work, a significant amount of time before the election ever happened. Uh, I talked to a myriad of individuals about how they were feeling about the, ele the upcoming election and all of these different things. And <clears throat> I really uh, <clears throat> am astonished by how after the election, um, it wasn't so much that it was him specifically that was elected, it was just that something happened in New York and, and around the nation that destabilized a lot of people's trust in each other. And I had already set up a structure that was there to support dialogue with people of all different uh, shapes and sizes within uh, a specific setting where many people are walking by. So 
you know, a lot of elements put together, plus me introducing writing into the project, and that moment created for an explosion of expression. And a lot of people felt like they needed to channel it somewhere, and subway therapy at the time happened to be that action that people could really grab onto. It was colorful, it was, it was expressive, and uh, in many ways I think there was a lot of strength because I personally was nonpartisan and I wasn't pushing people to say any specific thing. And so tens of thousands of people, instead of really focusing on the election, focused on connection and love and being together and creating something that made people be able to uh, soften and then choose to uh, harden in, in, in to fight whatever foe they felt like they needed right. to, to Do fight. Do you charge? <laughs> No, I actually have a really <clears throat> strict policy where I don't accept even tips because, you know, I talk to uh, all sorts of different people and different uh, economic classes. So if somebody in a suit hands me a $20 bill and someone who's homeless that's walking up behind him sees that, he might not, or he right. or she might not sit down with me, and I think that's not something I want. Because yeah. a subway therapist after the election of Donald Trump <clears throat> in New York City, mm. if he or she charged, would be a millionaire right yeah. now, right? Um, <laughs> if I so had a tip jar, I might, <clears throat> might be doing pretty well. <clears throat> uh, my colleagues, I know uh, Councilmember Combo, and I don't know if anyone else has any questions for the panel. Thank you, thank you all for your testimony. I just have one question for you, Matthew. As an artist um, in this particular climate and now, you mentioned a lot about the hustle so yeah. what are some of the organizations or how do you make a living basically doing this type of work in this mm -hmm. day and age? Are there organizations, <clears throat> foundations, benefactors, fundraisers, um, or is it mainly the <clears throat> hustle and the grind that affords you the opportunity to do your work? Um, for sure the hustle and the grind afford me the opportunity because in that way I'm just absolutely fearless. There's no... I'm, I have no fear, like to come back earlier, I have no fear because Trump is president that I will not continue to do my work because I'm gonna do it regardless of, of organizational structure or if, you know, I'm not, I'm not attached to an organization that might not have funding anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just don't, like that's not something I really think about. Uh, in terms of money, you know, the project was so viral and people were so interested in it that I did get a book deal, which I, I got some money from. And so it's nice as an artist to be doing work and then get recognized and then have some inflow of money. But to be honest, I haven't really applied to anything that I could probably get lots of, you know, I could probably get money from different organizations within New York. But also I know that I want to support in the future. I'm writing a second book uh, for, for young students in the middle school range to be inspired to do work uh, that's public and participatory that invites the community to congeal. And uh, in that way, if I am, am a supported artist by all these different organizations, I don't know that I can passionately say you can do it by yourself with no one helping you. Because I really do believe that, that if tons of individuals all felt like they could make a difference by doing something very specific, mm -hmm. uh, more people would do so. But there's a lot of focus on getting money and how to live and things like that that actually prevents people from going out and doing any kind of work. But, Thank you. Yeah. I had a vision. I could see, I'm seeing like the Gates project and I'm seeing your sticky project and I'm seeing somehow them being able to come to life through a project like The Gates sure. a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, I would love to collaborate. I'm interested in having conversations about how to inspire young people to have a voice as powerful and interesting as yours. <laughs> and are, you, are you registered with the Department of Cultural Affairs with their Percent for Art program? No. You should definitely do that. OK. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, we'll definitely stay in touch and find how we can connect you with uh, DCLA and, and maybe the Arts Councils as well, who are uh, somewhere in the room, some of the Arts yeah, Councils. I didn't, I didn't write it on my uh, statement, but if people want to contact me, they can email subwaytherapy at gmail.com or go to subwaytherapy.com or Great. at subwaytherapy on Instagram, all that fun stuff. Very cool. Yeah. Um, thank you very much uh, to this panel. Um, now we have a group from the Vibe Theater Experience. Um, 
Why don't we bring all of you up together to hear from the vibe? And you'll decide how you want to. Um. Sure. Um, good morning to you all. We have uh, three short minutes and two prepared statements, so I'll go very quickly. I'm Toya Lillard, Executive Director of a Vibe Theater Experience. You if could, you notice. You could technically get three minutes each, so don't rush that. Oh, much, awesome. Right? Um, yeah. Great. Uh, I am a, a woman of color running an organization that serves girls and young women of color, I want us to all take a moment and note that. <laughs> and also, um, I would actually ask you to look at a new study that came out uh, by the Yancey Group that was uh, funded by the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, really studying organizations that are run by people of color. The conclusion was that uh, cultural organizations run by people of color, particularly here in New York City, are under-resourced and underfunded. And uh, we do a lot, I'm about to talk about it, so I just wanted to start off with that nugget. Uh, good morning, we are here from Vibe Theater Experience, a 15-year-old nonprofit arts organization that works to empower underserved teenaged girls to write, perform original theater, video, and music about the real life issues that they face daily. Through writing and performance, our young women amplify their voices, speak truth to power, and advocate for change in the way that young women of color are treated in schools, on the street, and often in their own homes. Vibe uses the arts to give young women of color the tools to navigate a variety of barriers and challenges. VIBE recognizes our unique role as an arts organization that engages girls and young women of color around the political, economic, and social issues that affect them most. We contribute to and advocate for a shift in the way that girls and women of color are perceived and a stop to the way that they are shut out of schools, institutions, and given few leadership opportunities. The arts and, supports for organization like, and support for organizations like ours is crucial in order to help fuel and support an artistic response from our youth to this current political climate here in Trump's America. As recent studies have highlighted, girls and young women of color are currently over-policed, under-protected, and face more threats to their physical, mental, social, and emotional well-being than ever. They have a lot to say about what, what it's like to live in Trump's America, and we should all listen. I'm going to skip. Uh, organizations like ours provide a sanctuary and a platform for the girls and young women who are most vulnerable. Our girls need the stage like they need air, because it is the only place where they can get, as we say, their nugget of free. Please support those who create intentional space for girls at the margin. Support the art that resists this notion of Trump's America. Trust and believe girls and let them lead the way. Thank you. Amen. Um, yeah. <laughs> Are others going to testify on the panel as well? Yes. Okay. Hi. My name is Aisa Tu Young, and I am testifying as a participant of Vibe Theater Experience. Do you want true democracy? Do you truly want outspoken people who value their own perspectives and are socially active representatives within our massive constituency groups? If you answered yes, then you want arts programs around like the ones I've been exposed to. Vibe Theater Experience fostered a connection between myself and adults that I hadn't had prior as a youth. When I joined Vibe, I was treated as a contributor, as an educator of my unique perspective, and as an equal. How many of us grow up and try to undo the emotional and mental damage that we've experienced as a youth? Damage that we weren't even conscious of accumulating due to the social structure that leaves teens no room to express the atrocities that have been committed against them, both knowingly and unknowingly, by well-meaning parents, teachers, mentors, neighbors, friends, and peers. Programs like Vibe 
have called me to speak on my struggles. Vibe has called me to speak on my opinions my, and turn myself inside out for the world to see. With each Vibe program that I've attended, with each session I've experienced, and every encounter with younger Vibe girls, I've become more and more eager to share with society. I've become more inspired to, and this theater-making company calls me to. Vibe has worked with me and young women just like me to shed light on perspectives we hold. Vibe provides platforms for us to display our contributions to society in a space that respects our individuality. What a real way to foster authentic contribution contributors in our society. Vibe helps us to hold our individuality as we shine our inner lights in every situation we enter. And that is the truth. Anybody? Thank you. Good morning, my name is Ian Field Stewart. I use they them their pronouns and I am a black, queer, trans feminine storyteller working at the intersection of theater and activism. With Vibe Theater Experience, I work as a program manager and teaching artist. I have had the pleasure of working with every single person sitting here in many different capacities and I wanted to speak today of not only the importance of centering women of color in the work that we do, but also the importance of centering and remembering those trans and gender non-conforming youth who are also a part of this particular movement. Vibe has been instrumental in my own development as an artist, an individual, and as a speaker not only in its belief in my ability to lead, but also in its assurance that I am valid, that I am needed, and that I am necessary to the process of creation and development. The theater is a space where we can imagine and project the future as we wish to see it. Art itself is that as well. When we tell stories to each other, the way that the way that I, the way that I, in my activism, that I see theater and activism and storytelling specifically is that I see racism, sexism, transphobia, classism, all the many isms that you can think of as a series of stories that we have reified throughout history to the detriment and oppression of others. I see Vibe Theater Experience and many other organizations where I tell stories as the way for us to tell new stories that insert, re-envision, and disrupt the common narratives that we have formed around the bodies of marginalized people. I think that cutting funding for such organizations and cutting funding for anyone who would seek to tell stories that empower and uplift and include, rather than tweets that may exclude, are, is an unwise decision. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm the Development and Communications Associate at Vibe, and, oh, Amaya. Um, <laughs> and, I mean, I'm, I think I'm gonna keep it pretty short. I think funding is, I mean, funding is essential to our operations, and we're all um, run by women of color, and I think understanding that, uh, so I worked in a lot of uh, different nonprofits, been involved in different nonprofits through growing up, and I think it's important to highlight the fact that our work is not just sort of serving participants, but actually making meaningful change with each person we work with. And part of that, I think, is representative in our leadership structure. And when we talk about funding, our organization re really relies on funding to ke just keep us going and really make sure that we keep um, doing the work we're doing and providing sort of not just you know, a program in high school, but also sort of long-term sustainability with the people we work with so that they can also enter into positions of leadership. And I think that's something that we also should talk about, that like the work we're doing is not just for each individual and their healing process, but also systemic in actually changing concrete change. And when we talk about the Trump administration, um, I think looking at our organization and the fact that we kind of need funding to keep going um, and that that funding will create, at least in the work we're doing, you know, new leaders and new leadership. And it's not just, you know, I worked with other nonprofits who sort of skew statistics or skew um, demographics to sort of present themselves in a certain way, and that's not the work we do. The work we do is actually making sure that each person we work with has a chance to create change. Um, and for example, we've had sort of students that we worked with, you know, perform in front of their schools and change policies at their schools regarding head wraps, regarding different things that were um, discriminatory, but also maybe not recognized by the school administration as discriminatory. So like thinking more, more broadly about sort of the systemic change that we do um, and the importance that our funding does to even just hire staff and 
really keep us like on the ground moving. Thank you. Um, first of all, <clears throat> listening to this panel and the panel before, uh, I can't help but uh, keep thinking in my head. Um, God, I love chairing this committee. I love uh, chairing the Committee on Cultural Affairs and Libraries. I love this community. Um, and if you had never heard of Vibe until the four of you came up onto this panel, I'm sure that every single person leaving here thinks, wow, that is an amazing organization. Those are some fierce women. And uh, <laughs> this is an amazing place that's doing amazing work. And I'll just stipulate that whatever funding you're getting is not enough. <laughs> Thank um, you. And uh, you need and deserve more because obviously uh, the impact that you have I think that means I'm cut off, right? Um, no, that was the last of Amaya's time. <laughs> no, no. The chair gets to talk as long as they want. Um, but uh, uh, seriously, it's just amazing and, and really empowering uh, to hear uh, the voices. And obviously, uh, as a member of the LGBT community, I'm always particularly uh, thrilled to, uh, to see um, the trans community included in a meaningful way, you know, present, visible, uh, vocal, and, and so thank you all for that as well. Um, it means a lot to me personally, and I know to every single person uh, here, but uh, you reinvigorate me uh, when I hear your stories, um, because I think all of us, uh, I, I won't say all of us, a lot of us in this moment of Trump uh, are you know constantly searching for that that nugget right that sort of allows you to be hopeful mm -hmm. um, that 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 uh, promises a better tomorrow than today is and and I said this at an opening of a uh, second stage theater right that uh, it's really art culture performance um, spoken word whatever that actually sustains us and is going to sustain us through this period and allow us to get to that better day, which is not just um, the transition for, to a new administration, <laughs> one might hope, but to actually more systemic change, right, that is beyond just removing a president. Um, so uh, with that, I'll uh, ask if any of the other panelists have a question. Thank you so much. You. We want to thank Majority Leader Lori Combo for believing in us from the start. Have you all had an opportunity, and just let me, I echo the sentiments of all my colleagues. This is so wonderful to see you here today. Um, have you had an opportunity to do work specifically around, quote unquote, Trump America in the sense of to do theater, to do programs? And have you found that it has been difficult to get funding to do that type of work? And also, with some organizations, outside of the arts, I would say that some organizations, because of the threat to their funding, individual contributions have, um, have gone up. Have you found that individual contributions have gone up as people have started to say, let's take funding and support of the arts into our own hands? Are organizations, foundations beginning to conserve uh, supporting the arts because of the Trump America? Or what are you experiencing and what type of work have you all done around this? Quite frankly, our foundation support has gone up um, and our biggest supporters uh, support um, the way that we're moving forward with transparency, investing in young women of color in terms of being the next leaders of this organization and in the world. Uh, individual giving has gone up. We've always struggled with individual giving because our community of supporters is people of color um, who tend to have less cash, right? Uh, individual giving has gone up. We ran a very successful campaign where we raised um, $10,000 uh, and it was mostly through Facebook. The one area where we uh, continue to struggle, uh, which is probably understandable, is corporate support. So that has not 
uh, uh, improved uh, with Trump's America. But we are encouraged uh, that foundations understand what we're up against. Uh, we, we can tell the truth. We can be who we are, uh, bring our authentic selves to the table, and really advocate for change in a way that helps us grow as an organization. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag, but I feel very good moving forward about how we're growing the organization and the support that we've been able to garner. We just got New York Women's Foundation support, which is super important for the work that we do. Uh, and it's all because we've been doing these shows that have been responding uh, very specifically. Uh, and the, the girls write every word uncensored. Uh, and we do them in schools, in communities, on stage, at places where people pay to go see theater, um, real uh, professionally mounted productions. And I think uh, people have responded positively. And just one final question. What's next for your organization? What is the next stage? What is the, what is the vision, the long term? And that could, be, that could go on and on, but just kind of like we ideally would like to Ideally, I would like to talk myself out of a job. I would like to see these young people run the organization. Uh, seriously, uh, it's time, you know. Um, time's up on people who are of a certain age running organizations on behalf of young people with no connection to young people. Uh, it's time to give it up, and uh, I want to work hard in the next couple of years to raise a lot of money to turn this organization over to the young people who will take it to the next level, which includes uh, in, uh, intentional programming for gender non-conforming youth of color, which includes being in more schools, which includes really uh, doing more advocacy work and changing the way that young women of color are seen. I did that very thing. I created my organization, ran for office, and turned it over to them. But that's about the only You're way wrong. you'll be able to turn it over. So consider it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to add, like, we're part-time, and we're we, you know, we're trying to create sustainability and there's only so much you can really do as a part-time employee. And so really jumping off of what Toria said, our statistics, our work is there. So we can get funding from foundations because we're honest and we actually have like proof to back up our honesty. Um, but yeah, corporate support's hard and even individual donors, it might go up, but I think right now people are trying to sort of are freaking out about foundation and government support and really trying to move into individuals and corporations, and that's something we're doing, but obviously that's a very like hard transition. Mm -hmm. And um, so, someone mentioned earlier, like NEA funding is kind of one of those stamps that helps you move into other fields. And so I think when we're talking about funding, sort of in corporation and individual giving, that's sort of the way we're transitioning. But also when we're talking about mm -hmm. goals for our organization, we're really trying to think about what ways can we spend the money to actually create like capacity and sustainability? And so part of it is just salaries. Like we're not, we're really doing the work without necessarily doing it for money. And that's very, very hard when you come from communities that don't have wealth. Um, and I think that's really important to say because, you know, and connections too. You're talking about like, if you don't have wealth or connections, how can you really take a job that underpays you, especially for the qualifications that you have? So. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> so, someone, someone mentioned the hustle earlier, and I think that uh, this organization is, is an embodiment of that, of like, yes, we, yes, we have so many opportunities and, and wonderful things are happening, but we are all still individuals who have not only, you know, vibe to think about, but also like our, our, our lives outside of vibe, our lives as performers, our lives as activists, our lives as just people who are trying to exist in New York City and pay the rent that's due every month, you know? Um, but yeah, so just to uplift what that was, oh, May was saying. Oh, and for programming, as far as like specific programming that we are um, heading into, uh, as Toya said, we are, we are um, in communications to develop um, more uh, staff trainings um, for uh, around um, culturally specific, uh, tr culturally specific work that is centered around trans and gender nonconforming youth, but also developing programming um, for the, that community as well. Um, we have an opportunity uh, to, um, that we won't speak to quite yet because nothing's been signed, but uh, an opportunity that will hopefully take um, work that was produced last year and bring it to um, a, a, a pl the place that, it, that the work was based off of. And hopefully that will be an opportunity for the young women to travel outside of New York for the first time for many of them. Um, there, there's, so, there's so many exciting things happening as, long, as well as our continued programming of creating uh, theater and work that is um, centered around the issues that affect these young women in an uncensored space. 
and all with one full-time staff member. So we, again, want your support more than ever. Thank you. Uh, very inspiring. You have made the most of your uh, 12 minutes here. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Um, <laughs> thank you very much uh, uh, to this panel. Uh, our next panel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen Atlas uh, from Arts and Democracy and NOCD. Uh, Simi Linton, I believe, from uh, Disability Arts NYC. Uh, Susan Hapgood, Hapgood <laughs> ISCP. Yes. And Abu Farman. Abu Farman from Art Space Sanctuary. Are all four you. of you with us? I think so. Great. Are we ready? Who would like to go first? Yep, you're up. Push the button. Push the button. There you okay. go. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Simi Linton. I am one of the co-directors of the Disability Arts NYC Task Force, known as DANT. Uh, we are an activist and policy-shaping organization committed to fostering disability artistry in New York City. Our testimony outlines ways to consider the roles of disabled artists and disability artistry in any endeavors emanating from this convening. Uh, I've housed that in six points. Disabled artists have articulated through our work resistance both to the dominant culture's definition of our lives and resistance to our social positioning. Therefore, we are adept at deploying art to both disrupt and upend. Number two, further, we have articulated how metaphors and imagery of disability are used to taint and demean people. These are useful perspectives to share with an art world keen on resistance. Number three, disabled artists share with many other artists an acute awareness of the use of art as resistance to combat the virulent forms of racism and misogyny that have particular currency in this moment. However, we bring a unique perspective to resistance to other underlying ideologies which have been given new airings of late, such as eugenics, utilitarianism, and notions of worthiness that affect us all. Number four, disabled artists are marginalized in the arts world and are also marginalized in conversations about diversity and underrepresentation. We are therefore concerned that coalitions built to develop artistic response to the political situation will not include disability arts expertise. Number five, the disability community is looking for allies from outside our constituency who can support our resistance to particular threats to disabled people's safety and rights, in particular the cuts, cutbacks in Medicare and the demonstrations outside of Mitch McConnell's office as, as witness to that, and also the recent deliberations over the bill H.R. 620, which passed in the House and is on the way to the Senate, which will erode uh, key elements of the Americans with Disabilities Act, therefore jeopardizing our rights and our freedoms. There's more, and I will leave this testimony. Yeah, one more point, right? Yeah. Feel free to say your sixth point. Okay. Um, as in the example above at Mr. McConnell's office, where disabled people resisted arrest and were dragged out of their wheelchairs by police, yeah. or the 1990 Capitol Steps crawl, where disabled people dragged themselves up the 80 marble steps of the Capitol to demonstrate for our rights, we have honed a form of art as resistance that can lend flavor and meaning to broader endeavors. Thank you.
Boy, am I really glad I, I uh, asked you to finish that. That was very powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who wants to go next? You got, yep. Thank you, uh, committee chair and council member Van Bramer and council members Borelli, Cumbo, Kozlowitz, and Moya for the opportunity to testify today. I am Susan Hapgood, executive director of the International Studio and Curatorial Program. Over the past year, it has been extremely empowering to present art that expresses refusal to comply with and accept the views of the current presidential administration. Art's ability to communicate, to inspire people to think differently contributes to bringing about change. The International Studio and Curatorial Program in Brooklyn is the fourth largest arts residency program in the world. Um, we are situated in a neighborhood of heavy industry intermixed with residential blocks. Inside ISCP, as our nonprofit organization is better known, we are surrounded by artists and curators from all over the world, including New York City. We are a highly diverse bastion of resistance, individually and communally. Uh, throughout the year, we organize exhibitions and public lectures, bringing together a range of viewpoints for a diverse public. Rather than speaking in the abstract, though, I want to offer three examples from our recent programs where art is used to catalyze resistance. The first example was a public performance in early 2017 by an alumna who was an Iranian artist named Gazelle, who performed about coming into the United States from Iran. Her long-planned art exhibition at ISCP coincided perfectly, and not in any way planned, with Trump's travel ban prohibiting visitors from six largely Muslim countries. She arrived a few days after the unconstitutional ban was first lifted, seemingly miraculously at that time, for us, and performed a riveting work about horrible personal experiences with our country's immigration officers. Gazelle's art made the inhumane ripple effects of the president's xenophobic actions crystal clear and immediate. Storytelling is central to my second example, too. We are working with the Mexican-born, New York-based artist Pablo Helguera on a social practice project happening at Los Suros, a housing advocacy organization in Williamsburg. Helguera invited dreamers, immigrants who came to this country illegally as minors, to come to workshops to tell stories to each other and to the public. Here, art literally gives voice to immigrants to tell the stories that nobody's heard and that they haven't had the chance to tell. Resistance to Trump's revocation of DACA is central to the work, articulated by immigrants who were promised a pathway to citizenship that is now severely threatened. Here again, art is a bridge from the personal to the political. And next week, Dutch artist and ISCP alumna, Jennifer T, has been invited back for a solo exhibition. At the opening on Tuesday night next week, the artist will stage live readings in six languages on the subject of resistance that are adapted from or taken from books dating from 1850 to the present and selected in collaboration with the British poet Jane Luti. The exhibition responds to current political upheaval in Europe, the US, and beyond. Can I have another few seconds? Um, and aims to bring about personal and social change through positions of resistance. Uh, we are proud as an arts institution to organize international programming that fosters communal, humanitarian, and political awareness, dialogue, action, and change during this extremely challenging time. In particular, we take issue with restrictive immigration policies, and we celebrate the city's cultural immigrant initiative. All of ISCP's public programming is supported by funding from City Council District 34 and the Department of Cultural Affairs, and we could not do our important work without your support and encouragement, and we thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, as I've said before, the Cultural Immigrant Initiative is, is one that I uh, created with uh, the former speaker, and um, something I'm so incredibly proud of, and when folks uh, come before this committee in various ways and talk about it and demonstrate how it's uh, helped um, makes me feel really good, like I've done something uh, well here uh, in the city council, so thank you. Karen, do you wanna go next? Well, you knew I was gonna say good things about the Cultural uh, Immigrant Initiative, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Karen Atlas, I direct Arts and Democracy, and our mission is to engage the power of arts and culture to further civic participation in social justice, and so we are involved in many resistance activities. Um, it's, art does many things. Just a few days after the election, we had our cultural organizing workshop, and 
I think that what art did there was it just, we were paralyzed. People were paralyzed and in despair, and it revived our spirits and gave us strength for the fight ahead. A year later, the workshop was very different. We were strategizing, we were building power, and we were thinking about ways to direct our art strategically. Um, it's really important in our work that we collaborate with activists uh, in our neighborhoods and across the city and across the country. In our neighborhood, we're playing a leadership role in Get Organized Brooklyn, which is uh, led by Council Member Brad Lander, and we were a co-sponsor of a civic particip participation um, festival. Um, we're also, with support from the Cultural Immigrant Initiative, uh, doing programs in the Bangladeshi community of Kensington, and the first thing we did right after the election was to have a get your, Know Your Neighbor dinner. And we felt like it was important for immigrants in that community to get to know the neighbor, their neighbors who were um, all the different folks that live in that neighborhood so they can have each other's backs and be resources for each other. And we continue to use arts and culture uh, to support immigrant rights. Um, citywide, I also direct Naturally Occurring Cultural Districts New York, and we had a learning exchange where we invited uh, immigration activists to really talk with us about how arts and culture could support um, activism uh, related to immigration and um, Art Space Sanctuary, and you'll hear more from them soon. Um, uh, was part of it, and they're uh, putting forward a call for the Department of Cultural Affairs to um, uh, support a sanctuary summit, and uh, both Arts and Democracy and NOCD support that call. Um, also, we work nationally, and it's very important, we think, now to reach out to progressives in other states and to support each other in our work. And so, in particular, in the U.S. South, we've been working with our colleagues there and inviting them to New York and bringing New Yorkers to their states to work. Um, we also are a member of a national network called Magnet, which is fighting around media justice and specifically net neutrality. Um, so the last thing I just want to kind of emphasize is that for those of us who are in this for the long haul, we have to remember that we're what we're fighting for and not just what we're fighting against. Mm -hmm. It can be exhausting to just be reacting and we need to be movement building. And we need to remember that these fights started long before the election, that we need to keep fighting um, to undo racism, and we need to keep fighting to build the leadership of the people in the communities most impacted. And I'll, I'll end with one last thing. I think you can see today f and hear from people what amazing work is happening in the cultural community related to civic participation. And I think the city should formalize some structures to really include arts and culture as part of civic participation efforts. Thank you. Thank you, and, and uh, again, I, I know that not everyone shares the same reaction to the election uh, or had the same initial experience, but you telling the story of that first convening after the election and uh, it being a very different experience, one was really about sort of picking people up off the floor um, and, and um, uh, reminded me of a town hall that I had in Queens, our version of uh, uh, Brad's uh, thing we call Queen's Values, and we had over a thousand people come to a town hall uh, a week or two after the election. And um, as I was talking at the microphone, I could look out over a thousand people, and I could see a lot of people crying. Uh, uh, and then I had so many people after that tell me uh, that that convening, hearing other people speak, sharing thoughts, ideas, and uh, was their beginning of their recovery, um, that before they had actually had that meeting and that moment of fellowship, um, there was no hope. And, um, and I think your experience as well, art and fellowship is the way that folks have been able to uh, transition to now um, really fighting incredibly hard. Next. So I'm, this, I'm going to be reading this <coughs> on behalf of a couple of or, a few organizations, which include Mine Art Space Sanctuary, uh, also NOCD New York, No Longer Empty, Dance NYC, Judson Arts, Dream Yard, Playground, Sunview Luncheonette, Arts and Democracy, Center for Art and Activism, Fourth Arts Block, Downtown Arts, and The Point. 
And as you mentioned today and others have, to immigrants in general and specifically community members with precarious status have been uh, a direct uh, target of, of attacks by the federal administration and ICE has worked really hard to sow fear in our communities, uh, arresting, detaining people without w a warning and with impunity. And as we've seen in recent cases, people who speak out, cultural organizers and activists uh, get targeted as well, and we feel strongly then that the city's cultural institutions can be an important voice uh, in the struggle to keep these communities safe. Uh, and aside from providing important cultural resources, museums and libraries can be sites for building much needed solidarity. Art Space Sanctuary, along with the New Sanctuary Coalition and other groups, have been organizing institutional trainings to provide guidance and strategies on how to manage the situation, how to be prepared and committed, and how to organize safe spaces. And that our model has been very successful in raising awareness, changing policies, and putting into place practical measures. So we invite the Department of Cultural Affairs to consider organizing a sanctuary summit for all cultural organizations and libraries to discuss these matters with a specific request to provide institutional training to, all, to the attending organizations and B, to provide information on what art and cultural sanctuary spaces could do and how they might declare themselves sanctuary, sanctuary along the guidelines provided by Art Space Sanctuary. And there's a list of guidelines which I won't go into, but they're, list, they're on, the, on the sheet that's been passed out. Um, so, and we're all ready and committed to collaborate with the DCA and other city offices to make this happen. Thank you. Great, thank you, and obviously, um, I don't know if DCLA is still in the room, but we'll make sure uh, uh, that they're aware of your, your testimony as well. Um, thank you all for being here and for your uh, testimony and for sharing your stories with us. Uh, I wanna call up the next panel, Patricia. Parker from Arts for Arts, uh, Charlotte Cohen from the Brooklyn Arts Council, and Branka Duknich from the Queens Historical Society, and Asatu C from Malian Cultural Center. I think I've got everyone there. We should sort of do this as a tandem thing. It's like a Thank you very much. And we're gonna be a little tighter on time uh, going forward because we have a, uh, another hearing coming in at one. And uh, so uh, if I could just ask everyone to be as concise as possible. You've waited for a long time and I wanna thank you for that uh, and know that you have our undivided attention um, for the duration of the hearing. And I wanna thank Councilmember Borelli for, uh, for sticking with us and hearing from so many folks. Who would like to begin? We can start on my right, <laughs> your left. Is it on, the red light? Just push the little button there. Oh, okay. There you go. My name is Asetusi, and uh, I'm the president of uh, the Malian Cultural Center. Hmm. I like to read my Statement. Sure, of course. <laughs> okay. Okay. Malian Cultural Center, and wish we have a. I I have served as the executive director. We are a five one one c three organization, devoted to issue that face women and children through the medium of. The Malian Cultural Center, we provide program for audience in New York City to build West African artists and cultural competency while becoming equated much of the diverse cultural 
expression that exists in this city. We administer after school program for elementary and middle school students. We hold indoor and outdoor performance event to introduce and share Malian and West African culture expression, plus other public forum and event. This event assists us in giving voice and support to many social issues, including female genital mutilation. In today's environment, culture, culture, and especially African and it, it is diaspora culture are more important than ever. The entire culture landscape of the American enterprises is being challenged and devalued. The modern day incorporation of African div divide, derived culture okay, <laughs> as a significant and valid cannot and should not have it import dimension. This has already been taken too long to be recognized. recognized. I will articulate a few of the broad stroke of culture and return to African divide culture contribu contribution and importance. Culture is a treasury of knowledge, which is essential for physical and intellectual existence of human being. Culture preserve knowledge and help its transmission from generation to generation through languages. The preservation and accumulation of knowledge define sit situation. It also defines what we eat, drink, wear, when we laugh, weep, sleep, love, what work we do, whatever God we worship, what knowledge we rely upon, what poetry we, reci we, recite, we recite. Um, I have your time has expired. How much more do you have? <laughs> Just Is that one minute. <laughs> okay. Okay. Culture defines attitude, values, and goods. Our measure of goodness and desirability are defined through cult culture lenses. We are socialized on those, those values. Culture decides our career choice and may set imitation on our choice. Some may defy, other may find other athletes. Culture provides behavior partners, it direct and define individual behavior it provides personally. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. We'll just go right down the line then. Hi, I'm Patricia Parker. I'm the founder and director of Arts for Art. And I did that, I started about 23 years ago. Um, 
I present um, mostly avant-garde jazz, but in all, its, in all the disciplines, it's, we define it as not only the music, but the dance, the poetry, the visual arts. It's built around the idea of avant jazz or free jazz or whatever you want to call it because no one likes any names in this music that I present. Um, but it's mostly African American. We've struggled with this because people prefer it if it's all African American or if it's mostly white with one or two. Those are acceptable. When you really, when uh, Arts for Art is, I would say, 75% of our 60, it depends a bit, but over 50% certainly, and many times more than, much more than that, uh, it's African American. So we struggle with that. Um, but the first year that we, that we started it, um, we, we, we didn't have any money. Uh, I, had n I had no training as an arts administrator. I'm a dancer who presents music. So, you know, I'm special. Um, and, uh, but I looked around at the, we had, there was a group of musicians that we were meeting with and I said, we are our own resource. We don't have any money yet, but we are a resource. And then I knew one of the musicians actually had money, so I told him one of his, one of his gifts is his money. And so he gave me some. It was $2,500, and we did a five-day festival with like uh, five times, about uh, five groups a night. I guaranteed everyone money, much more than I had. And because I knew, I had this feeling, I knew we were going to succeed, and we did. And that was 23 years ago. Uh, but it was based on this concept of we can do it. It was also based on the comp. The, uh, that, the, that means the time is up. Um, it says two minutes. No, now we're going to. Uh, so your, your three minutes expired, and, and now they're setting up two minutes for the next person. Okay, I did yeah. three minutes already? Okay. Yes, it goes by very fast. Um, <laughs> it goes all by right. very fast. So all right, well, I would just ask you to I wrap just... up with one concluding thought. All right, now, we're, uh, now we have Arts for Art, the Vision Festival, which is built in, uh, then there's no difference between really creative art and telling the truth. So we, we de define the music and the art and the, social, uh, and the call for social justice. These are all interrelated things. Inside the music and the art itself is this sense of freedom. Yeah. And that's what we bring. And then we bring it to the streets through Artists for, uh, Artists for Free World, which is a marching band, which is the sound of resistance. Absolutely. All of this is... True and wonderful. Uh, I thank you for your passion. I, unfortunately, it, unfortunately, three minutes and then two minutes goes by really quickly, but, okay. um, but it matters, and, and I appreciate you. So we're going to move on to the next panelist. And again, we are uh, a race against a very important hearing that's going to take place here about sexual harassment and a package of uh, bills. Uh, I'm proud to have uh, one of those bills um, that's going to be taking place here at once. So we're going to try and go a little bit faster if, if everyone can work with me. Thank you. I'm Charlotte Cohen as director. Is your light on there? Yeah. Is it on now? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm Charlotte Cohen, director of Brooklyn Arts Council. Thank you for hearing my testimony today. How do we resist and respond in these times? We must trust artists. I made that statement at a public art symposium in Hong Kong last week, and an artist who has been incredibly courageous in his public art protest to the government there responded, don't ever trust artists. You can't trust us to do what we say we're going to do. In those two perspectives, we have our answer. Trust artists to do the unexpected. Brooklyn Arts Council has always been committed to supporting artists, no matter what their form their work takes, by providing services that strengthen their careers and finding ways for it to reach the public. This support ensures that they are able to create artwork at the grassroots level, meeting and engaging communities locally, and making the work accessible, relevant, and meaningful. 
When New Yorkers have the chance to develop and share their artistic voices, the voices of the individual grows clearer, and simultaneous, the vo simultaneously, the voice of the community becomes stronger. Now more than ever, it seems that this work is necessary. The arts help provide both clarity and solace in challenging times, create communion instead of divisiveness, and give expression to thoughts and fears that bind people across a wide spectrum of backgrounds and life experiences, as we've been hearing today. I want to thank the City Council for your leadership in delivering the City's first cultural plan, Create MIC, an important step toward examining and prioritizing the City's critically needed support for arts and culture. Um, it's of great interest was the SIAP report that preceded the cultural plan that demonstrated with data what we've witnessed and known in our hearts all along, that the arts improve lives and communities. Uh, Bach is proud to partner with the Council on your init cultural initiatives. And as I learned firsthand in Hong Kong, the eyes of the world look to New York City as a cultural capital, and what we do here resonates around the world. And I just want to um, hope that you'll join us at our grant celebration at Brooklyn Borough Hall on Wednesday, March 21st, to help us disperse almost half a million dollars, oh, over half a million dollars in those much needed and much appreciated funds. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for several parts of that. First of all, reminding us to trust artists. We heard before uh, from Vibe about the importance of trusting uh, women, black girls, uh, and um, so many other voices that don't get listened to, heard, or, or trusted. Um, and also, uh, the invitation is great, but also I'm really proud, of course, that we fought for a real increase in funding for our five borough-wide arts councils uh, that now gets to go to individual artists and other groups throughout uh, uh, that one million dollar increase that we fought for, I fought for really hard. Because as you know, I was past president of the Queens Council on the Arts before I got elected to the City Council. So speaking of Queens, um, uh, our next uh, last panelist on this panel. Yeah, hi, let me see if this works great. Uh, before I start, thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. It's pretty hard to do that. So my name is Branka Juknic, and I try to run the Queen's Historical Society. Um, we've been a historical society for now 50 years, but we're trying and striving to do more than that. We're striving to be a community hub with only three staff members. I'm the only full staff. Uh, there's two part-timers and plenty of interns. Some of them are documented, some of them are undocumented immigrants, one of which actually uh, got her DACA status, so we're happy about that, uh, that we celebrated that yesterday. Um, the Queen's Historical Society, I'll just be brief, QHS, uh, tries to document and present the borough's history, but we also deal with present issues um, uh, throughout Queens. So with exhibitions, community outreach, and school programs to Title I schools, we really strive to bring out the best of what Queens has to offer, again, with contemporary history um, and also art. So in the past few years, again, we were trying to sort of renew what you know, the concept of historical societies and historical museums uh, really are. We try to bring out, and with your, with your help, we're going to try to do that uh, even further, um, the outstanding women of Queens. For example, women that people are not really familiar with, like astrophysicist Lisa Randall that lived in Fresh Meadows, or Grace Lee Boggs of Jackson Heights, or of course everybody knows Betty Friedan. We try to bring out through our exhibitions and community programs more information about these women. Also, um, this fiscal year and the past few years, we've tried to bring out immigrant voices of, again, documented and undocumented immigrants um, through their self-expression, specifically Corona and Jackson Heights, and we're really hoping to do that in other um, areas where we interview these um, specific individuals, let's say, um, and they talk about their um, um, experiences with human rights violations and so on. I'll be very brief. Uh, two art exhibitions I would point out. You'll see everything in the pamphlet. Um, hopefully, again, we're kind of worried about the cur current political climate in which we might not get funding, in which um, one of it is of soil and tongues. And it deals with um, dif different immigrant voices, in this case, um, uh, voices of racism and xenophobia uh, through visual arts. 
um, Vietnamese Americans, Afghani Americans, and many, many other uh, artists will feature uh, uh, um, through this sort of interactive exhibition um, their art. And again, we need your support. So <laughs> not enough time for two minutes. So we hopefully will be able to accomplish um, our projects and, and talk more about their voices in the next upcoming um, You did years. great. You squeezed about five minutes into oh, two and a half. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it was amazing. Um, all of you are terrific. I do want to say uh, a special note to you. It's yes. great to see you. I didn't know you were coming today, but obviously I, I am a, a Queens resident and represent yeah. a district in Queens. Uh, I love all of our cultural organizations equally and all of our boroughs equally, but I did happen to look at your new newsletter just yesterday oh, in great. the office. So yes. for anyone who wonders if you send me your stuff, do I look at it? I do. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I'll prove it because I had not seen your new logo um, and I was very impressed with the new logo, but I love the newsletter. Thank um, you. Yeah. I, it, it, you know, I, I was a member of the Queens Historical Society. I'm not sure I'm a paid member right now, but I, I love the Queens Historical Society. Thank and, you. And, um, you know, it's gone through uh, various uh, challenges over the years, shall we say. Yeah. But when I saw your newsletter and I, I went through all the invitations and newsletters yesterday, as I do like once or twice a week, you know, uh, and, I, and I stopped on your newsletter because I was like, wow, this is beautiful. Uh, it was glossy. It was uh, uh, it was different than I've seen it in the past, mm -hmm. uh, for example. So, uh, a, I just want to say that to you to encourage you to keep going and keep building the Queens Historical Society. And that's my chief of staff, Matt Wallace, right there. Okay. And you should ask us for money uh, okay. this year. Thank and you. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, make sure that, that we're doing everything we can to support your work because I love what you're doing with the Queens Historical Society. Thank you so um, much. And also encourage everyone else to send me your stuff because I read it and I look at it. Great. Um, so thank you very much uh, to this panel. Our next panel, Chris Wisniewski from Studio in a School. And are you bringing James Reynolds with you from Studio in a School? And then we have Adam Jacobs from Kids Creative and Julia Liu from Children's Museum of Manhattan. And then we have three more panels after that. Okay, all right. That's right. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, staying. For those of you who've been uh, waiting in the wings for a while, and we apologize, we are um, on a two minute clock and we're gonna try to be as faithful to that as we can. Um, so with that, uh, Julia, why don't you start? Thank you. Good morning. First, thank you Chairman Van Bramer and committee members for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Julia Liu and I'm Director of Institutional Planning for the Children's Museum of Manhattan. Although our name only mentions Manhattan, we work in the five boroughs. We're grateful for the speaker, the city council, and the Department of Cultural Affairs for their commitment to the arts. Your support is essential to our work at the Children's Museum. For more than 40 years, we have ensured children learn to celebrate diversity, embrace differences, and treat others with respect. The arts experiences we offer provide the freedom and safety for children to express themselves. Recently, children have placed wishes on our wishing tree, hoping for no guns. After the 2016 election, parents and media sought our counsel on how to talk to children about the election results. We're proud of our role as a trusted institution that gives children and families the opportunity to explore through the arts. Resistance can be defined as the ability not to be affected by something, especially adversely. The museum chooses not to be negatively affected by what is going on in our world. More than ever, we are committed to doing what is right for children. The arts play many roles in our lives, culture, and politics. They comfort and challenge, they educate and inspire, they engage us emotionally, intellectually, and physically. Through the arts, we experience different perspectives. Their magic, breadth, and majesty empowers us to resist the belief of a single worldview or a solitary set of ideas. The museum's work is grounded in research showing that the years from birth to age eight are critical years for developing positive social and emotional skills. Children are learning about self-worth, self-control, racial awareness, and the complexity of the world. 
The arts help children make sense of it. Every day, our young visitors delight in our programs at the museum and in shelters, libraries, schools, Head Start centers, and hospitals citywide. I'd like to highlight innovative work we're doing with the Department of Homeless Services, which has been going on since 2014. We do you could do that briefly. I'm actually familiar with the program, of course, but. We've got three sites in Queens. Tell me those three sites in Queens. We've got a site in Councilmember Drum's district, Danique Miller's district, and Donovan Richards' oh, district. That's terrific. But serving all New Yorkers is important. We resist by treating all New Yorkers as equals, regardless of their means. We're opening two new shelter sites next month and would be delighted to offer you a tour. Sure. Let, I'll follow You're opening up. new shelter sites. In partnership with DHS, we're going to go in there and do physical transformation and deliver programs and host families for free at the museum. Mm -hmm. And they're given a free membership so that they can return any time that they'd like to. Right. Great, but the museum is not running a shelter or, or uh, right. No, we, we don't run right. the shelters. Right. This is why DHS is such a vital partner with us. Right, okay. So um, I, I wanna go to our next uh, uh, panelist just because we're, we're okay. uh, sort of moving along, I apologize. Chris and Mr. Reynolds. Um, well, thank you for having me today. I'm the executive director of Studiona School in New York City, the largest visual arts education in the city, education organization in the city. We hire and train professional visual artists like James to teach art in schools and publicly run daycare centers in all five boroughs, serving over 30,000 students each year in nearly 200 schools and sites, prioritizing communities of high economic need and schools where there is no art teacher. The children that we work with at Studio are largely part of those communities that have been most deeply affected by some of the more troubling political changes and debates we have experienced over the past year. Most live in economically disadvantaged neighborhoods. Many are immigrants or the children of immigrants. A significant percentage of the students we serve live in transitional housing, and many are students with disabilities. We observe that many of these young people have experienced trauma and live with a high level of stress and anxiety. In a political environment where we have ongoing heated debates about economic policy and immigration, I often wonder who is speaking for these young people. And it's in this context in which I would like to argue that one important aspect of our work is to provide an outlet for creative expression, agency, and validation for these young people, and a chance for them to de depict the world as they see it. When you put a paintbrush or an oil pastel in the hands of a young person, you're gi giving them a chance to speak for themselves. We see this in the experience of a four-year-old girl at a pre-K class in Queens who just last week made a collage depicting her family's weekend trip to the park. She speaks only in Spanish, and so her artwork provided her with a rare moment of communicating with the other students in her class. We see this in the drawing of an American flag made by Jade, a four-year-old in Bedford-Stuyvesant who was inspired to make her drawing because, as she said, I don't know if we'll be able to stay in this land. We see this in the experience of Alberto, a second grader in the Bronx, also a recent immigrant. Alber Alberto rarely spoke, and according to his classroom teacher, gave up on work easily. Then his artwork was selected for studio in a school show at a gallery in New York City, and it became a turning point for him, changed his entire educational pathway. These are the examples that reflect the reality we encounter every day in schools and community-based organizations in the city, and we appreciate the support of our work that we receive from the city and the council. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is James Reynolds, and I've worked at Studio in the School since 2004. Uh, it's an honor to be here before the Cultural Affairs Committee today, uh, and it's also an honor to be able to stand before uh, students at PS 123 in Harlem where I work as a full-time artist instructor at, for Studio. Um, they are interested and engaged. Our young artists look forward to the moments in the studio where they're able to observe, question, problem solve, collaborate, and synthesize their wildest dreams and ideas through the creation of art. In art, they're called upon to transcend the realities of income inequality and immigration. They're able to envision a brave new world where they are the arbiter. They value the art education. They value that art education grants is akin to air during this or any other administration because these young, brilliant minds want to know that their thoughts, their beliefs, and their ideas not only count, 
but that they can make a difference. And that is really what we're working to facilitate every day. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Adam Jacobs. I'm the co-founder executive director of Kids Creative, and we provide uh, arts education programs throughout New York City. Um, I'm going to just talk about a few points. One is funding. Um, the we received two our two of our largest funding sources are federal 21st century community learning center grants. Uh, in the last two proposed budgets, those have been cut entirely. So not just NEA, NEH. We're an arts education pr uh, program and, and uh, would cut our, a majority of our funding at that point. Uh, it's for 750 children in East Harlem and the Bronx. Um, the second point is that we, we do get CASA funding, we do get uh, city funding, but, but federal funding is um, at that level the, the largest uh, opportunity to, to serve that many people. Um, I, I, I think you can keep going. Okay, keep going. okay great. Thank you. Yes. Um, the second point is that one of our big main rules is that there's no teasing or fake teasing. Uh, we t talk to our students and our staff about how to not fake tease. Um, fake teasing is essentially somebody decides that they feel like they're being teased. When we look at what's happening on Twitter, uh, I'm just going to put that one out there, that, the, that uh, it's really difficult to discuss uh, peaceful conflict resolution. With the current uh, with the current landscape, um, the third point is that I was speaking to my my wife this morning as I was coming here. She's an organizer with the Women's March, and she's actually organizing a, a, a walkout on March 14th. And the thing that I didn't put in here: we are a positive, proactive peace education organization. So we work with uh, students to try and identify a conflict before they become violent. And so I don't have anything about gun violence in my testimony. I've been working in schools for 18 years. The idea of being equipped with a gun is uh, scary. Um, it doesn't make any sense. And our students don't know how exactly to, uh, to work with that, as well as a lot of the work that we've been doing is based uh, in communities that have been dealing with gun violence for a very long time. Um, we try to approach the systemic oppression that's in our, our schools, the uh, de facto segregation that's in our schools. And I'll just tell you a quick story in the Very summer. Very quick, because you, oh. you were deprived of oh. your appropriate beep, but it just went off here, so. Okay. I am your uh, it's a It's a alarm. very quick story. Our kids make up plays. That's what they do. Uh, they made up a play in the summer of 2016 during the election time of a, uh, an individual who won an election uh, his name is Piermert Delano, uh, and he won, he decided to get rid of all color. He said that black and white is the way to go, that color divides. And um, our students were really just trying to express the fear that they had even before the election took place. Um, it was a really engaging story, but also really telling of what their concerns were. And um, at the end, he decided that uh, he was colorblind. Mm -hmm. uh, that he, he actually could not understand what he couldn't see. Well, I uh, appreciate all of you. Uh, this was our um, uh, sort of kids and the arts panel. Um, so uh, your work is incredibly important. And obviously when we talk about the current moment and how art and culture are helping uh, to both uh, create resistance and or to uh, ensure health and overall well-being of of people, obviously children are the most important of that group. So thank you all for all the work that you do. Um, I'll excuse this panel and the next panel, Mark DeGarmo. Um, looks like Lutz Rath and Martha Bowers or from Dance Theater, etc. on the Van Brunt and Rudolph Shaw from the Caribbean American Rep Theater. Is everyone here still? We have two more panels after this. Um, right. Who wants to start? This time we'll start left to right, my left. Okay. 
Um, hi, I'm actually Heather Harvey, the marketing director at Dance Theater, et cetera. I'm here on behalf of Martha, who had to step out for a development meeting. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to testify on art as resistance. Um, Martha is the executive director and founder of Dance Theater, et cetera, a cultural organization based in Red Hook. As each day brings new challenges from the White House, I think the most important work we can do as artists is refuse to accept the current state of politics in our country as the new normal and keep informed about what policies are forming and legislation being enacted to think strategically about our responses. Dance Theater, et cetera, or DTE for short, is addressing the urgent need for resistance in three ways. First, we have worked internally to recommit to our core values and have allocated resources and time to trainings for staff, board, and our teaching artists on understanding and undoing racism in our work. Secondly, through our school and community-based arts education programs, we challenge our students to use their acquired art skills to think critically about the issues impacting their lives and address those issues through their creative work. We aspire to helping create a new generation of engaged and informed citizens and artists. And third, we produce arts events such as our annual Red Hook Fest, a free two-day performing arts festival that features socially aware artists, showcases resources offered by local nonprofits, and encourages cross-sector socializing in a rapidly gentrifying community that is home to Brooklyn's largest housing projects. This year, the festival's theme is artists as activists. We are embedding artists in local community organizations to lead workshops that ask the question, what does engaged citizenship mean? We, as a New York City arts organization, are proud to stand with our New York City Council in resistance to the Trump, to the Trump administration's many dangerous policies. We encourage you to continue supporting all of the nonprofit cultural organizations that provide safe, creative spaces where we help develop the next generation of artists and citizens. Additionally, it would be helpful if the Department of Cultural Affairs could provide webinars and detail the rules and regulations governing nonprofits with regard to political activity. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Rudolf Shaw from Caribbean American Rep Day Theater. Thank you for having us here. Um, I'm going to just read a few things that I have here um, in the interest of time. We recognize that such movements like the Black Lives Matter and um, the LGBTQ uh, gains have been bonsai by the policies of the Trump administration. Historically, theater arts have enabled social exploration that can dismantle the suffocating foundation of an authoritarian administration. In this current environment, the theater arts are needed to stimulate independent thought, create positive discussions about human existence and political engagement. In that light, our company, Caribbean American Repertory Theater, is grateful for the support that we receive from the City Council, particularly Councilman I. Danik Miller, for the Cultural Immigrant Initiative Award, which enables us to create awareness and celebrate the various cultures in our community. And through this type of award, we've been able to do a work called Biko Rising in collaboration with um, the Biko Foundation in South Africa uh, to bring, to use his words to inspire the youths in our community. Um, the big problem we've had is uh, immigration issues whereby this current administration denied visas to the artists that we were collaborating with from Africa and they couldn't come, so we didn't, couldn't do the full work. Another work we're doing is Haiti's Children of God, which we did several years ago when um, they had the earthquake. We are now redoing that work to inspire the immigrants in our community. We have a very large immigrant population. And it's, another work is Echoes from the Diaspora, whereby members of our workshops, they write stories based on their immigrant experiences and we build that into a performance. Um, I'm not gonna say too much. Um, we just want to encourage the city council to keep on funding us and um, give us the opportunities to empower the youths in our community. Thank you very much for your work and for shouting out the Cultural Immigrant Initiative again, uh, which is uh, um, really terrific, and I'm glad that uh, Councilmember Miller is uh, so supportive yes. of your organization. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mark DeGarmo. I'm here um, as director of Mark DeGarmo Dance. We've just celebrated our 30th anniversary as a not-for-profit in New York City, also as a vendor for the New York City Department of Ed. Uh, I'm just going to jump off of what I wrote because it was way too long. Um, 
but a couple of highlights. I think I want to thank the president, actually, for sort of revealing the dark underbelly of our soul, of the American USA soul. I was just working on some projects in Mexico City and Quebec City, and it was just interesting to see the international outrage of our colleagues on both ends. At Mexico, there's a little more humor. Build your wall, keep you crazy Americans and your guns to the north. But in, in Canada, a real socialist country, there was really outrage about how could you, where is it going, we're terrified. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about our basic partnership program called Partnerships in Literacy through Dance and Creativity that we've been bringing for 20 years to New York City public schools, fairly much um, free of charge. I think the council members are well aware that New York City's DOE is the third most uh, segregated big city system in the country, even though it's the largest school district in the country. Um, so we're fighting constantly issues of equity. And what I still see in New York City public schools is a huge inequity, no matter what the, um, the promotion has been about increased numbers of arts accessible opportunities in the schools, that's not my experience. Dr. Cynthia Celestine of uh, Jesse Owens, PS26 and Bed-Stuy has said to me repeatedly, we don't even have a skeletal budget, we have no budget for the arts. How can this continue in New York City, the arts capital of the world? Um, our partnerships in literacy through dance and creativity was just um, uh, researched by Johns Hopkins University as the first embodied cognition um, a program that's ever been studied in this way, and we had statistically significant increases in our children's state reading test scores. Um, also a tremendous support from the teachers as well, wanting it to come back. So I would just continue to advocate that we look at funding structures. We've been very gratefully funded by DCLA for 25 years and two city council members, but it's way inadequate to the numbers of students organizations like ourselves could be serving if there were actually more money available to support us. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you for spreading uh, the message uh, in Mexico and Canada that, uh, uh, that we are actually still <laughs> a country that has values that are not uh, espoused by the president. Last on this panel. Hi, I'm Lutz Rath, uh, director and conductor of the Washington Square Music Festival. Thanks for having me. The, it's hard to justify what can classical music do, or so-called classical music, in order to protest any kind of political movement. Anyway, we're sort of specialized a little bit, and we're a little bit the Enfant Terrible. The New Yorker uh, called us once the most eclectic outdoor festival uh, in this country. Uh, we are eclectic, but we are provocative. Uh, by the way, it's our 60th anniversary this year. We are the longest outdoor festival in, the United, in uh, New York City. Uh, when Kennedy got shot in 1963, a lot, Leonard Bernstein said, this will be our reply to violence to make music more intensely, more beautifully, and more devotedly than ever before. The Washington Square Music Festival has been a long history of doing the provocative programs. Just to give you uh, an example that some of it we represented music which was called degenerate or forbidden music between 1933 and 1945. Also music which was composed in concentration camps. Anything which had to do with authoritarian regimes. I spare you the names right now, but also for instruments that normal people don't hear as a solo instrument like the xylophone, the, uh, the bass trombone, and the harmonica. The diversity, of course, of Washington Square population is enormous. Remember John Reed in 1927 climbed on the, on the arch and declared Washington Square the 51st state of the nation. <laughs> the, uh, we have in our history very diverse personnel. Our first conductors were the African-American conductor. We had Marilyn Horn on it. We had Winston Marsalis as a soloist when he was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, the Satori band who was a survivor of the Rwanda uh, massacre. The, uh, we have been funded by you with grateful and cause we want more. The, <laughs> we will also to stay with us because we really like to continue to provoke and we create thought for the audience. And it has been for 60 years free to the audience, to the public. 
and uh, the audience, we are packed each time, and we like to continue. That is a very good thing. Uh, thank you, and uh, it's, uh, I'm thrilled that we have classical uh, music represented here uh, in terms of resistance. So thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, our next panel is Brian Gilliam, is that Brian Gilliam? Yes. Downtown Art. <laughs> Dr. Indira Etwani or Etwani? Okay. And David Martin. Do we how many do we have? Two or three? Nope. And we have Yeah. And do we still have the folks from the Immigrant Arts Coalition? Anyone here? Yep. Okay. You're the last panel. We'll bring you all on together. Um, uh, I think there are several folks, right? Yeah. Oh, no, we can bring, right? Right. Is John from uh, the coalition? Right, there you go. John, why don't you join this panel then? Yep. Then you can both join the panel. Yeah. Okay. Great. So why don't we go back to this side first. There you go. Oh, make sure your light is on there. Yes, push the button down. There you go. Well, thank you very much for having us, ha uh, having me this uh, morning. Uh, American Indian Artists uh, Incorporated has been instrumental in the continuation of a rich legacy here in the city since 1987, begun by bold and innovative Native American cultural leaders affiliated with the New York movement of contemporary Native American arts, these Native artists determined very early that because Native Americans were the most under-resourced group in the United States, Amerinda as an organization had to have very specific strategies in order and focus in order to survive and thrive in the highly competitive and status-oriented art world of New York City. Uh, we're celebrating our 30th anniversary and uh, Amarinda, since its inception, has exemplified a community-based arts organization inculcating strength from within, which is necessary to any resistance movement. Um, Amarinda uh, continues to uh, reflect the needs and desires despite its own struggles with racist and insensitive portrayals in theater and film, as well as fraudulent and racist experiences within the local political climate especially related to real estate. Amaranda has spoken out for its rights, sought to enlighten and fought to gain redress for great inequity, and we will continue to do so when necessary. Unfortunately, Amaranda's experience in recent years has again been one of inequity and engagement in a non-transparent real estate process in the city that excludes organizations of color, maintains preference to white organizations. As the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People 2007 states, all indigenous people have a right to the perpetuation of their unique legacies for future generations. For Native Americans, the phrase seven generations has an incredibly significant meaning, that of protecting the earth for the generations to come. Yet even this phrase has been commercialized and become the name of a product brand. We're not interested in symbolic gestures. We want equal consideration and not special treatment. We're looking for fairness and respectful consideration. Amarinda will continue to nurture and foster this creativity for the next 30 years with the blessings of the creator and the inspiration of all native artists of whatever discipline who continue to come to New York to find freedom to express their individuality, creativity, and identity. Thanks. Thank you. Hey. My name is Indira Atoro, and I come to you as executive director from the historic Billy Holiday Theater and Restoration Art in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Central Brooklyn, home to the largest community of people of African descent in New York City and indeed the country. I come to you as a leader of the cultural centerpiece of the first community development corporation in the nation, 
founded through the bipartisan efforts of Senators Jacob Javits and Robert F. Kennedy Jr., inspired by the grassroots efforts of community activists. The Billie Holiday Theater and Restoration Art are byproducts of the civil rights and black arts movements of the 60s, both movements of resistance. With five decades of experience in one of the most underserved communities in the city, we have a unique perspective on art as resistance. 2018 is a year marked by uncertainty and fear with an emerging national agenda that has left lower income community members, immigrants, communities of color, the LGBTQ community, women and Muslims anxious about deepening injustices and inequities. At the Billie Holiday Theater and Restoration Art, we are driven by our ever deepening commitment to difficult dialogues with dignity. We understand that these are only going to become more important to our community and national narrative. We also know that art is a force for change beyond the marketplace of ideas. The arts confer unique and meaningful benefits to the communities in which they are housed. They are heralded as a contributor to academic performance and student discipline, economic prosperity, physical and psychological well-being, safer neighborhoods, and social capital. Supporting the arts is not just a symbolic gesture of resistance. It is the resistance. In closing, I would like to share a quote from Nobel Prize winning author Toni Morrison, one that informs our work at the Billie Holiday Theater and Restoration Art. This is precisely the time when artists go to work. There's no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That is how civilizations heal. Thank you for your time. Thank today. you. And the two of you together, right? Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm Laura Paris. I'm the AED of the Coalition for Hispanic Family Services, Arts and Literacy, After School and Summer Program. Um, <laughs> And he's John Stanesco, the director of middle school programs. And we're funded through DCA and DYCD. We're in 10 different neighborhoods in Brooklyn and Queens. And um, I just wanted to say thank you for creating this forum. I've been taking notes on what other organizations are doing. And I'm so inspired and encouraged. And um, while I've been sitting here, I've been thinking it would be great, in addition to funding, which of course we really need, um, to have a web presence of some sort where all of these organizations can share these ideas and where New York City could put the word out there about what we're doing and what we stand for as a city. I wanted to share one of our projects, maybe more time um, permitting. Um, so um, right after the elections, our families, we have 1,300 children and their families that we work with in arts and literacy, and the fear was palpable, and our team of teaching artists and art therapists thought we have to do something. One of the many things we did was we created an immersive, interactive installation that was shown at Knockdown Center this October to highlight, um, well, really to showcase our children and families' feelings about what was going on. We encouraged um, all of our parents, which was an amazing experience of sort of group art therapy processing, to imagine what they think borders should look like. And we created a huge projected montage that was projected on two permeable walls that created a corridor. Um, and we had hundreds of pictures imagining more open borders. We also collected interviews, and we had kids um, decide how they wanted to react, what sort of projects they developed. I'll tell you about maybe three of them. <laughs> um, so one of them was a really moving puppet show where the kids retold a story of one of their family's immigration experiences and how when they came to New York, friends and family supported them, helped them get work, etc. Another group of kids developed a skit exploring how the electoral college undermines democracy and how the process of impeachment functions. That was their idea, not ours. Can I um, ask you to wrap it up? Sorry? Tie it in a bow. Wrap it up and tie it in a bow, if you would. And, our la and one of our soccer teams in Queens developed a video art project showing how youth from different countries and backgrounds display teamwork. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I appreciate all four of you uh, hanging in there, and I'm glad you got something out of hearing everyone else testify, which I also feel is very inspirational. So thank you all for 
being here today and joining our hearing. And um, essentially, anyone else left in the audience can testify. <laughs> um, no. uh, <laughs> so we have um, Christopher. Is Christopher? Yes. Sti oh, thank you, Christopher. Marlene Fitzpatrick. Marlene Fitzpatrick. Uh, Marlene, I had to take off. No uh, worries. And then we have uh, Sita Chang. Sita Chang. And I think uh, you are the final two uh, to testify at this hearing. Thank you again for your patience and for hanging in and uh, sticking with us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. All right. We'll be very fast. My name is Christopher Massamine. I'm the CEO of the National Yiddish Theater. I'm the chair of the Immigrant Arts Coalition, and I'm a trustee on the Alliance of Resident Theaters New York. So with the National Yiddish Theater, I'll start at the beginning very quickly. Uh, founded in 1914, established officially in 1915, we are the oldest continually producing arts organization in the US and the longest continual operating Yiddish theater in the world. Uh, we were founded on the basis of social change, folks being a means people stage. It's been that then, it's that there today. We served audiences of the first immigrants that came over. We also served audiences of the LGBTQ uh, community when they were unable to come out. We served women when it was looked down upon for women to go out to the audiences, uh, be part of audiences and theaters alone. So social change has always been part of what we do. I had an idea that became an action that ultimately resulted in what's very fast becoming an, a movement. We have several, many several, you know, multicultural, multi-ethnic groups in New York City as pertaining to the arts and culture. I always wondered why the dialogues really haven't come together. So as of last year, we created the first Immigrant Arts Summit, which brought together over 50 multicultural organizations in New York City, government bureaus, agencies, foundations, et cetera. By the end of it, we had a round table and we decided we need to do something about this. Based on four principles, we formed the coalition, which serves uh, advocacy, empowerment, diversity, support, and collaboration. Those are four important things we've been doing a lot of things with. I'll give you an example of one of the things we did. Recently, based on this asinine situation with the US Citizenship and Immigration Services, re uh, recounting basically and taking away the idea of the statement of this being a country for immigrants, uh, we wrote the administration and we're hoping for a response on that. Uh, several other things we're doing um, entail collaborations throughout all of these communities, figuring out how we can find, share representations with different audiences, uh, look at the different problems we have, whether they be community issue relations, whether they be, I'll tell you, oh, very quick, uh, whether they be um, situations where there are more threats and more anti-Semitism and more, uh, I guess, feelings of hatred in this country, or whether they be things like um, talking about uh, visas and getting people on board, we're looking at that. Um, there's all sorts of other stuff we're doing. All I'll say, I'll conclude with this, is we're continuing the dialogue. Uh, August 6th through August 8th, we're gonna do the second Arts and Immigration Summit at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. It's gonna be great, it's gonna be big. We're here on the local level, but we're m moving very quickly towards the national stage. Thank That's you. great, thank you. And last but not least, <laughs> Hi, I'm Sita Che. I'm a violinist from all-female mariachi band Flor de Tololache, also an executive director of Cosmopolis Collective. I want to start with a quote by a puppeteer from Sesame Street who said yesterday, mean people are mean because they fail, uh, they fail to imagine. They lack imagination. And that's, that says a lot because a lot of people who who fail to connect with people, who dismiss different people, fail to put themselves in different position, and they only see things from the surface. This is where art comes in, and I fear that at this state of the current society, um, in many ways, art has failed the society to remind, to revoke, and to to awaken our empathy, empathy to connect, and to, to realize that we are actually so much more connected than we know. And that's why I believe in cultural art, and that's why I, ref I formed uh, Cosmos Cosmopolis Collective. We are musicians individually pursuing pure art, but as a group, we bring our background from Korean culture, from Indian culture, Puerto Rican, and as an American people, because 
we are all an immigrant here, undocumented or documented. And I, want, I wanted to emphasize uh, importance in highlighting the traffic between cultures. It, the cultures are not just diverse or colorful. There has been so many interaction between cultures that makes us who we are right now. And it is, I believe it is our responsibility as an artist and also as people who support art to shine upon that and to support that cause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, quite a way to end, and I know a lot of people have uh, uh, joined the room for the hearing that's coming afterwards, but uh, for those of you who are new, we're just concluding a three-hour hearing of the Cultural Affairs Committee on Art as Resistance in the Age of Donald Trump. And so uh, this was the last person to testify in three hours. It's been an amazing hearing, uh, learning how artists and cultural organizations are responding to uh, America under President Donald Trump. So thank you so much for uh, sticking it out and being here for three hours with me and uh, the rest of the committee. And uh, we will continue to fight on. So thank you all very much. And with that, we are adjourned before a very important hearing takes place in a few minutes in this very room.